All right, wonderful. Well, I've tried to make the trade alert super easy to, to follow today uh, and to really simplify everything. So hopefully this will uh, be super clear. I'm gonna go ahead and do the trade alert, do some Q&A, then look at news and charts. And then we do have an additional uh, piece of content from Aaron. I'm not sure if he's live yet, but he should be in here soon to go into more tax savings strategies. Okay, great. Let's so go ahead and get going. We were recorded quite a long time ago, so we're just going to start those recordings early from now on. In case you want to go back and catch any of the content Dean presented, it will all be there for you. Okay, so let's start off reviewing the text message. Today we took profits on our 157 TLT call option expiring tomorrow. We sold the 145 put that provided some benefit when we were below 145 for a few days. And this was when there were margin calls globally. And first they put all the blame on good old Ray Dalio and anybody who was long oil with a leveraged position. Uh, but now the data is coming out that actually central banks had to uh, take some profits off their treasury positions because they're out of dollars, which is really interesting. And so we'll look at the dollar index and how it's starting to pop back up. In fact, let's just go to this one. I think this will really be our indicator that uh, poop's about to hit the fan. We got to be careful what we say on this YouTube recording, but uh, every time this pops up to a high level, that does signal, especially emerging markets are really suffering a dollar shortage. And it creates a system where uh, they can't convert their own currency into the dollar uh, without losing a lot of value in their underlying currency. So they start selling US assets that are denominated in dollars. And so that helps them uh, get that dollar shortage fixed. And so Six trillion dollars later, we were able to pop the dollar index below 90, or rather below 100 for a few days. And here it comes climbing right back up. Uh, so it does look like the Fed has purchased about a trillion dollars of US treasuries since this fiasco began. And they do seem intent on continuing that. So for our short general position and long treasury position, uh, we do indeed want to see the dollar index rise. Now, for the health of America, we don't. Uh, so, but unfortunately, that is the case. So today's trade alert, again, was to sell your TLT call. Everybody got in at different prices at different times. Uh, so I'm not quoting percentage returns. But in general, TLT has been going up. So I'm sure everybody has a nice profit on that. Or 145 put, you're going to get very little out of. Again, that was the worst case scenario. If people kept liquidating treasuries and for whatever reason the Fed did not step in, uh, we wanted to have that downside protection. So we've moved that up to the 164 TLT put, one put option per 100 shares of TLT. So again, this is what we call the married put lets us sleep safely at night and not have to worry about getting absolutely hammered if something catastrophic happens to the bond market. Now, right after I did the trade alert, they finally announced how much of that 30 year treasury they're going to issue. We'll take a look at that, uh, but it doesn't look like they're confident to really ramp up the quantity and supply side of that 30 year treasury yet. They're still just loading the boat on the front end of the yield curve. <clears throat> so that's good for us being long the TLT uh, in general and does signal to me that they're going to slowly ramp that up, uh, which is again what we're predicting is a slow steady grind in the TLT and at some point a vicious drop in the S&P 500. Uh, so they've thrown everything including the sink at the market with $6 trillion in stimulus <clears throat> in every shape you can imagine uh, from repo to American banks to repo to uh, international central banks, essentially begging them not to sell their treasuries uh, to come up with dollars, which they need to operate their economies and pay their debts. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, so here's the chart of the TLT versus the SPY, which again, we've been predicting would cross over uh, for quite some time. And now it's done that. And I expect this to continue crossing over until the underlying problem in our economy is resolved. So we'll talk about the underlying problem in a little bit. Let's look at our positions. Okay, so I had a few actions today. I sold the four, the April 3rd, 157 TLT call option. And I sold my 417, 145 TLT put. So those are the two options I sold. Now, if you're new and you don't have that position, you're not gonna be able to put that position on. The next thing I did was I added a married put to protect my TLT. Now, my hope is that this put option goes to a value of zero, which would mean the TLT has gone up in value. So we're hoping that the cost of this put is less than the appreciation we earn on the TLT between now and next Friday. Now, my main concern at this point was that uh, the Fed would come in with a massive issuance on that 30-year treasury and potentially cause the yield to spike. Uh, but today they did come out with that announcement finally, right after we sent out the trade alert, and it is a minimal increase in the 30 years so far, uh, which does beg to, to ask the question, you know, when are they gonna actually sell this 2 trillion? Why do they say they're gonna sell it at the 30 year? And then uh, the issuance that we do see is heavily loaded on everywhere except that 30 year. Uh, so we can see this has just gone up immensely on the front end of the yield curve and the T-bills. Uh, these were all in the 20s before all this chaos began. And now you can see it's doubled and tripled. Meanwhile, the normal 17 billion per month is being offered on that 30 year, which typically is only sold once per month. Uh, so that's in my mind, extremely bullish for our TLT position. So to reiterate, if you're an existing member, we let go of our 4-3-2020-157 call for a nice profit. We let go of our 145 TLT put for a near 100% loss. But again, that was designed to protect us. It did do that job. For a little while, TLT went all the way down to 139. So again, the puts are designed uh, to be held to expiration. And if we're underwater, they reduce our losses dramatically so that we get the strike price. Uh, so we're hoping that this new put we've purchased will lose all of its value and the TLT will go up by more than the cost of that put option. So I did, do intend to continue buying cheap weekly puts that expire the next Friday uh, until we get towards that 180 level on the TLT, in which point, I do intend to um, going to try to hold the TLT equity position so that we can achieve the long-term capital gain and not be uh, pushed out of it for a short-term profit. So we'll protect that with put options and allow us to buy and hold through any volatility in this position. So that will be my goal. So that again, we don't have to uh, realize any profits on the TLT once we get to that 180 level and instead we'll protect it with uh, a put. So as we get closer to that 180 level, expect me to buy more expensive puts to protect the underlying. Okay, so here's the only ETFs or equities held in the portfolio currently per $75,000 for a pro level membership. So I have 200 shares of the TLT and 400 shares of GDX. Now, I've made a little notation as to whether the position's a buy and hold. So that means it's good to enter the position if you don't have it, but if you do have it, hold. And then I've also notated which positions are already up so much that it's not a good buy today. And that the reason why it's not a good buy today is not because I think we should sell that now, it's because the cost is so much more today than it was when I first placed the trade uh, that you'd be taking on extra risks that I don't endorse at this point in time. So to reiterate, per $75,000 in the Model Pro portfolio, I'm long 200 shares of the TLT. That's still a good trade. 
and I'm long 400 shares of GDX, which is still a good trade. On the TLT options, I have two 164 TLT puts expiring April 9th. Remember Friday is off for Good Friday, and this position is essential. This is really critical to protect this position. And um, I was tempted to double down on this to go to an 80% position, have not made that call. Uh, but if I did, I would do it with the married put and I'd have a pretty tight uh, married put. So for now, there's we're not making that move and you're still just at 200 shares per 75K. So to reiterate this, if you had 150,000, you would double all of these numbers. If you had 300,000, you would multiply by four. If you had 900,000, you'd multiply by 12, et cetera. So per 75,000 total following the system, then that's our model portfolio risk. Okay, these three TLT calls have gone up in value and are more expensive to enter today. So these are in the money and not a trade I recommend for new members today. Now, if you already have it, you're set to jet and we'll slowly let go of these call options uh, only on Thursdays, unless there's some sort of emergency to get out early, then I would do it on a Tuesday. Uh, the 170 TLT call expiring January 15, 2021 is still a good trade. And that is a setup of two call options per 75,000 total invested. So these three are not recommended to enter today. If you have it hold this position, your married put is critical. And again, we're expecting it to lose all of its value and for the TLT to continue to rise. On the call option, this is still good to hold and we have a lot of time premium. This was our most aggressive bet on the TLT. Okay, the GDX is not naked, it has the married put. So because we have 400 shares of GDX, I have four GDX puts. And that's again, per 75,000. I have the 23 strike expiring May 15th. So we're still hanging on to the gold. The, the worst news that came out overnight about the gold market was that Russia is going to stop purchasing gold. And they've been one of the biggest buyers of gold. Uh, so it looks like they're trying to raise some dollars to keep their economy operating and uh, starting to sell gold offshore. Um, so they're doing a lot of things in Russia to become a safe haven country to invest in, um, which is interesting. Uh, so they're not selling their gold so far, at least at the central bank level, but they are allowing the local miners to let go of gold uh, to create some profits. And there's a huge gap between what real gold is selling for versus paper. So I do currently like gold as an investment. And it does seem like it's starting to break paths with being directly associated with the the profit loss of the S&P 500. Uh, because if we want to remain long GDX or gold, uh, but we believe the S&P 500 is going to crash, that does cause a dilemma uh, in terms of how we're positioned. So I'm closely watching to see if gold can break past with the S&P 500 in terms of being so correlated to it, uh, as well as the crypt cryptocurrency markets, which again, is not part of this pro system and something we will discuss only in the boot camp. Okay, SPY options. I don't own any SPY, but I do own this set of puts. Now, if we go back to the house analogy, this is the cement foundation uh, that we're gonna build our house upon. We have a lot of cash that currently represents your walls, and we're gonna convert those into equities uh, after we've seen a significant sell-off in the general stock market. So these positions are still a buy and hold. If you don't have them yet, you can get in much cheaper than I did. Good for you. Uh, I'm not recommending increasing this, uh, just keeping the same risk per 75,000. Okay, we have two GLD calls. Unfortunately, we bought these near the high and GLD sold, sold off. I'm not selling them yet because we're getting a bit of a bounce in the gold market. Uh, 
but because this is not in the money, we do want to sell this with some time premium. So I'll likely let go of this uh, April 9th GLD call option on Tuesday of next week. So hopefully we can get some of our money back. I'm not expecting to hit a profit by then. I'm still planning to hold on to this position beyond next week. Okay, we do have a put option on emerging markets that's up nearly a thousand percent. And of course that's too expensive to buy today. So don't buy that today. But if you do have it, hold it. I expect to dump this in the next downturn. Now I was discussing opening a put option on FXI. I haven't pulled the trigger on that yet. Um, in general, I'm trying not to do too many trades at a time to ensure that we're all on the same page. So um, we have that exposure, we're up a lot, have not added to that position yet. If I do add it, perhaps it'll be Tuesday when we sell this GLD call. Uh, if you're following with the boot camp, you're up 3.3% in March. Now, if you took some TLT profits when it was at 180, you're up a lot more than I am. Uh, it was unfortunate I did not take profits that day, uh, but we did say if you have bills to pay, take that profit. A lot of you did. Um, if you're not in the boot camp, you're still up 0.7% approximately. And that's because of our two plays in the boot camp that are doing extremely well. We have a QQQ put uh, and a SLV call, uh, both of which are long in duration. One is uh, expiring this December for the QQQ put way out of the money and it's up big. I expect to sell that in the next big downturn. Uh, our SLV call options, a two year leap, and that's just slowly but surely gaining in value. And we'll likely be holding that into uh, 2021, probably a sell around January or February of next year. Okay, let's see if we have any questions in the ch chat box. Okay, Tyler. Um, so yeah, so the trade today is to sell your April 3rd, 157 call. I had a substantial return on that. I'm selling my 145 TLT put and I'm picking up a 164 April 9th TLT put per 100 shares of the TLT. So does that make sense, Tyler? Okay, Ron and Bill want to know why is the SPY going up? Because the Fed printed $6 trillion. I think it's running out of steam. Not worried about that. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so the Fed threw the everything it had at the markets. And now what comes next is two, three, four, five, six months of extremely bad economic data. People getting laid off. Uh, so I think you're going to see um, the selling pressure slowly but surely take over the S&P 500. Okay, Oscar says we sold the 417, 145 protective put and rolled into the 49164 put. That is correct. Oscar gets an A for today. <laughs> I was answering one of the other posts. Oh, good job. Thank you, Oscar. How's it going, Oscar? Well, what Dean said is is very accurate. I mean, uh, surgical staff and, and non-essentials aren't necessarily being laid off. They're being redeployed. Yeah, oh, man. Uh, I heard they're starting to fire doctors to complain about uh, conditions, working conditions, in New York at least. Well, I'm not seeing that, but but uh, they're not coming in. That's for sure. I mean, oh, I don't. They're not even coming in. Some of them. Some of them are not because you know they're they're not specific to to what services we are providing at this point, which are bare minimum, basically uh, addressing the COVID patients. Okay, that makes sense. And and obviously, I got to keep 
core staffing for for potential cases outside of that cardiac cases stroke cases those kind of things okay but that is cut to a bare minimum and and bottom line is um you know the name of the game is not to corrupt anybody that comes into the facility Okay, Kathy says we got a dividend on our GDX and also on the TLT. I'll uh, definitely add that to my, uh, oh, and I need to close out the March return, speaking of which, so I'll close out that. Uh, in fact, I'll do that on our boot camp today. We'll show how to close out and add in our dividend payments. Good, good point, Kathy, thank you. Yep, and uh, Kathy, while we're on that too, uh, TLT will get paid out next Monday, I believe. David L. Brighton says, can you speak to the strategy behind moving the TLT put expiration earlier than we were previously at 417? Uh, yes, yeah, so the old put was not providing much protection because it was the 145 strike. And we bought that during a very momentous downturn in the TLT. So it went below that for a while, popped back up. Um, so now I'm looking at cheap put option protection on a weekly basis uh, now that it looks like coast is clear and I'm not quite as concerned about downside risks. So expect to do a weekly, Great question, David. a weekly put to protect our downside risk on the TLT. Uh, Barry says, what will happen to gold miners when Africa runs wild and the mines are impacted? Uh, well, I think at the end of the day, Barry, that the, my, ma my main interest in gold right now is that uh, countries are printing money, right? Governments are spending more than they make. Cost of oil is cheap. And now there's this huge shortage of real gold in the world. So everybody's trading these ridiculous 10 times uh, fractional reserve products like GLD. Uh, but GLD doesn't, it has one tenth of the assets uh, in the vault versus the assets under management. So that's a huge discrepancy. Uh, so my take on that is that you want to get your hands on the real gold, however you can get it. Uh, if you go look at trying to buy gold coins right now, for example, you're going to end up spending like 2000, 2200 bucks an ounce for some of these nice coins. Um, so there's just a huge discrepancy. Anytime you can find a discrepancy in the market, kind of like how we were able to see what the media was reporting about uh, the honey badger disease versus what was really going on. There's a big discrepancy and that's how I was able to predict the stock market when no one else saw that coming. So, so now the big discrepancy I'm finding is that paper gold is being pushed down artificially by the big banks and there's a shortage in in gold. So who can create new gold? Gold miners can. So I love the gold miner product. Real companies, real businesses, are they going to have some trouble with volatility, with all, all the shenanigans in the gold market, with the honey badger uh, running rampant? Sure. But are they going to, at the end of the day, go make hay while the sun's shining? I think they will. So right now is really a great opportunity uh, for gold miners to to dig up that old barbellic relic and flip it. Um, and there's no shortage. They can't mine it fast enough. Um, that's how much demand there is for real physical gold. So that's the big discrepancy. And I'll be slowly but surely on a quarterly basis trying to ramp up our risk exposure to gold miners. And I can see us getting uh, significantly heavier weighted in, in gold miners at some point. But there's a lot of good assets that are going to be discounted. So it's going to be hard to choose. We want rock bottom prices in U.S. oil and gas companies, which have had a bounce today, but I think that will probably be short-lived. Um, do we want to get some healthcare, biotech, e-commerce equities, dirt cheap? Uh, a lot of people are promoting or asking if I like PHYS versus GLD. They claim to be fully backed by physical gold. Uh, well, I like GLD because it just absolutely dominates the trading volume. So it has a highly liquid option market. 
Uh, but I'll definitely look at uh, PHYS and take it into consideration in the future. Uh, but yeah, if you go try to find some real gold to put in your vault, good luck. You're going to be paying a lot, a lot more than spot gold on uh, GLD, a lot more uh, really than anywhere. So it's, it's difficult to find real gold. And I don't see that changing. I, surely central banks will sell gold uh, to help with their dollar supply and try to suppress the value of gold but uh, it's really inevitable. If you go and double the money supply, then you're gonna see price inflation and in, in everything under the sun eventually as that money flows through the economy and, and works its way through everything. Um, so again, inflation normally would be really bad for our TLT position. So I believe the Fed will have to look past all the inflation that's going to result from all this money printing. Um, and it's interesting, we're seeing some things deflate, some things inflate. It's not a clear picture as to uh, what the immediate result will be of all this, this money printing. But at the end of the day, uh, you really have never had a better setup for gold ever in history. Um, do I think we're per, perhaps a little bit early on it? Yes, that's why I only have a 10% allocation. And that 10% is really reduced to a 1% risk with the Mary put. So I'm risking in the next, until May 15th. So for 45 days, my risk in the gold market outside of those two GLD calls is less than, uh, it's something like 1.2% total risk. So not very much uh, that can be lost in that position currently. Okay, Karen says, can you comment on info about JP Morgan having difficulty in getting difficulty in general on the banks since mortgages biz lows. Yeah, so the next, so there's a few disasters unfolding. One is the uh, currency valuations around the world. Everybody's having a dollar shortage. So they're faced with either selling treasuries, selling corporate bonds, selling US equities uh, to, to fund their dollars. Um, so that's one big crisis happening. The oil crisis is having a little bit of a bounce today, uh, thanks to some positive comments out of Russia and the Saudis and Trump uh, buying up some local oil. Uh, but if the demand is just going to be crushed because the global economy is shut down for months on end, which is what I expect, uh, then I fear that oil is not at the bottom yet. Um, so this may just be a little bit of a short-term relief. Uh, in terms of the next big crisis, uh, Karen nailed it. As always, Karen, you're always on top of it. Uh, what's gonna happen with rent, just in general, commercial rent, private rent, uh, with all the layoffs, that's a, just a disaster. That's just an absolute disaster. Karen's calling BS on Putin. What do you think about Putin's uh, airplane of goods coming to, to us? You trust those? <laughs> is it just vodka yeah they're sending us <laughs> vodka uh, okay i'm going to take a quick break and go through some charts and news and i'll keep an eye on the questions uh okay. but yeah just to reiterate in general we're predicting a stock crash and a big bond move that's going to last for probably years uh, and that's because it's going to take a while to raise the money that they're. Uh, so first they ca so first they came out with eight billion dollars to solve this crisis, and you know I was the first person to say, yeah, right, it's going to cost trillions. Well, within thirty days they came out with a two two trillion dollar stimulus bill. Now they're coming out with another two trillion infrastructure bill. So everybody would think that this is great for stocks, but the reality is. Uh, this is where you should be focusing on. This is where all the money has to flow. So if you think big money is going to go out and just get whacked in the head, uh, then I've got news for you. The big banks don't like to lose money. Uh, Ryan, would you mind keeping the, the audience muted? 
Uh, but yeah, let's do questions that want to be audio. Um, so if you do want to talk out loud, go ahead and raise your hand. And That's I'll got his it. hand up. Yeah, let's do Ed. Uh, go ahead, Ed. You do have to unmute your mic. And to do so, Ed, uh, if you scroll down to the very bottom of your screen, a gray bar will pop up. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a, um, an icon that looks like a microphone. Just click that. That'll unmute your mic. And also, we got to keep it to questions, not comments, because we do have our boot camp today. So I have limited time, I'm afraid. Uh, let's also unmute James Goodman. I know he's always got questions. So let's make sure we get his answer. James, how's it going? And thank you. So I'm hoping this trailer, it's a little bit easier for you to follow, kind of walk your baby step through each step. Uh, how are you doing today? Does this trailer make sense? Yes, much better. Yeah, this was much easier to read. Very good, very good. Any questions, James? Not right now. Okay. Uh, how about Bill Richardson? He's always got some questions. Good morning. Um, no, I think I'm fine for now. You're ready for that stock market crash already, aren't you? Yep. <laughs> Good. Yeah, Jason, that layout is so much cleaner. Thank you. Yeah, I, very good. I'm glad. Uh, Tony. Yeah, I was just, um, just following up on this uh, allocation that you have there. The um, if we got a $75,000 account, we're going to be putting what, $30,000 in the TOT? Yep, just a bit, just a bit over that, but correct. 200 shares of TLT. 200 shares, that'll take us over to about 33 or 34,000 or somewhere in that neighborhood right now. Yeah, so I like the round 100 so I can protect with the put. Okay, I see. So that's the reason for it. Yep. Right. And uh, so if you get halfway between there, are you rounding up or rounding down? I guess it um, looks like you're rounding up, basically. Yeah, a little bit, just barely rounding up slightly on that. Another question, if you don't mind. On your put, I know we rolled from two weeks back to one week. And uh, so going forward, are we going to put that put on every week and readjust the price? Or what? Do you, what is your thinking? Or you think the COT? So, so when I bought that longer term put, the price action and the stability of the financial market was, it was screwed up. We should have been making so much money on those TLTs because the stock market was tanking, but the TLT was having one of the biggest sell-offs in history. So I was concerned. So I didn't know how long the chaos would last or really what the hell was causing it. So that's why we bought that uh, at the money or near the money put uh, with so much duration. I just wanted to have us protected with one simple trade until the coast had cleared. Um, so now today I do feel like the coast has cleared for the bond market. So I'm buying a much cheaper put just in case something unexpected happens. And the reason why I bought the one week duration, why do you think I didn't buy two or three or four weeks duration? Just a pop quiz. Anybody thinks they know the answer? Why would I buy a one week instead of a two, three, four week? Because it on a weekly basis, if I buy a four week, I'm going to save a ton of money on a weekly cost basis versus buying it weekly. So why would I only pay for one week of protection? What do I think is going to happen? Well, you got to think that the market's going to, the TLT is going to go up. That's right. So by next week, I want to buy, I want to move that strike up and kind of, I'm just chasing it up. So my prediction is TLT is going to really start popping for us. In case it doesn't, I don't want to have to worry about it. But if I'm correct, then yeah, you're right. I'm going to trail that put each week. Yeah, tighten it up. Also, Jason, one thing I noticed on that is um, <clears throat> that when you're buying them, yes, you're taking a bigger decay on time value because you're buying it so close to expiration, but the cost is low. Whereas if you buy it further out, 
you're going to have less time decay, but you have to pay so much more for it that you actually have more dollar decay, even though you have less proportional time decay. So, because yep. I, I sat there and looked at it and tried to figure it out and, and ran them side by side and realized that this was actually cheaper on a dollar loss rather than a percentage and time decay loss. Very good. And, and yeah, I, I'll tighten this up. Plus, A plus. I'll tighten this up. Once we get towards 175, you'll see I'm going to tighten the hell out of this put. But I do want to, I want you guys to get the long term capital gain on that TLT because I do think this puppy's going upwards of 240, maybe 320, which I know sounds insane if you understand bonds, which is, this will be a historical move. And I think it's going to take somewhere around two to three years to accomplish. Um, so because of that, I want to be able to hold the position the entire time. And we're only going to have short-term gains and losses in our options. So Let me ask you, you, tax savings. Yeah, one other thing, though. Um, why do you think the volume in the bond seems to be falling off a little bit? Okay, so realize TLT is a kid it's toy. It's not the real bond market. So it's just a proxy to the real market. That That's something you should... The real players are trading in lots of a, a million. Um, and, and it's only being traded in and out of these huge, huge banks. And I so I wouldn't, that... I, wouldn't look at, I wouldn't look at the volume on the TLT to try to understand if there's heavy buying or selling in the, in the treasury market. Because uh, just in the last month, the Fed bought a trillion dollars worth of treasuries. So that's a lot of trading volume, but it's not going to show up on the TLT uh, ticker. Go ahead, Karen. I guess that's that's the second part of my initial question is, you know, since it is just a proxy and this thing's been blowing up all over the place. I mean, look what happened when Dalio and Gunlock and whatever, when they all liquidated stuff, you know, I'm I'm. It is an ETF. I'm concerned about whether or not this this particular um, uh, structure is going to be able to sustain and reflect what it is that we're looking for it to do. You know, when things get so bizarre, which they are, I, that's where the that little you know red flag goes up for me and the hair on the back of the neck because I don't fully understand that part of it, but I do know it just gives me that warning that. I need to know more. No, oh yeah, no, nothing to worry about. This is okay. so. It's big central bigs. It was every big central. Let me try to find that. Here you go. Okay. This is what caused it. It wasn't even Ray Dalio. He is a little ant compared to these guys. <laughs> okay. So there's. That's what caused the sell-off. Thanks. Yeah, the liquidation, right? Because it wasn't just a whole bunch of they needed to. Okay. It to was a that dollar again. shortage. It was a huge dollar shortage. So uh -huh. they had to sell whatever they could to have dollars. Yep. Okay. So the whole okay. world operates with dollars, but there's just not enough. Uh, right. Now, it, the reason there's a shortage is because everybody tried to sell everything at one time and then all the banks were out of dollars. So that was the key problem. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the treasury market's by far the most liquid asset in the world, one. And then two, it's backed by the printing press of the Fed. And so they've clearly come in and signaled that they will buy every single treasury, period. Uh, and they bought uh, just under a trillion dollars of treasuries during this little fiasco that, that just played out in March. So the, the heavy sellers are out and I, I think we got some pretty smooth sailing now, when's the next time we should get worried about the treasury, uh, the US treasury market? I would say your best indicator is gonna be when the dollar index gets too expensive. So I think we're gonna look for a trifecta. So the, the trifecta to signal take profits is uh, at least for the bond market is gonna be number one is the DXY elevated, probably above 102. That's a good signal that people are going to need dollars. That signals dollar shortage. Okay, so that's one. Two, we're going to have another horrific sell-off in oil, probably. And then three is the 
magnitude of the stock crash going to catch risk parity funds over leveraged and off guard again. So if you get a triple whammy in those three markets at one time, it causes people to sell not what they want to sell, which is the losing positions. It causes them to sell the liquid position, which is that treasury. So if, if we, that's the lesson we should have, you know, figured out to take profits at that 180 levels. We had a trifecta that caused liquidations. So can, you had, can you say again what your last one was? That it was the, you know, the Dixie elevator to over 102, selling it off of oil and the magnitude of, what was that? I'm just making notes so I can understand as this happens. Okay, yeah. so yeah, so the assets that the, 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 let's go in priority. So biggest priority is the dollar. Um, right. The dollar getting strong is just really bad. That, yeah. That, that causes foreign investors to sell U.S. products, all of them. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they're going to sell their gold, they're going to sell their treasuries, they're going to sell their stocks, corporate bonds, they're going to liquidate because they have to have dollars. So if this goes up, that means that they're running out of dollars. Okay, if we get a sizable sell-off in the S&P 500, that's going to create pressure on the dollar. Okay, so if we see a move of this magnitude, TLT is going to be flying up, uh, but all of a sudden your prediction becomes your own worst enemy. So um, we need to be a little more greedy than I was previously, uh, or conservative, I guess on taking profits. So if we see a stock crash, a strong dollar and oil crashing all at the same time, uh, what we're gonna do is we're not gonna sell TLT, we're gonna buy that right at the money or maybe even an in the money put. So we can hold through and then sell that put to reduce the, the volatility. So it's not gonna take all the completely all the pain out of it, but uh, from a tax perspective, now, if you are trading the, T who's trading the TLT in a cash account versus a uh, tax deferred account of some sort? I am. Because you're, you're doing it. Which one are you doing in, Tony? Tony C. Yeah, I'm, I'm trading in, in my uh, cash account. Cash account. So for all you guys trading the TLT in your cash account, then... We really want to, if we believe TLT has a two-year growth perspective, then it's really in our interest to hold the entire time so we don't realize a short-term capital gain. Now, if you're in a tax-deferred account, you can buy and sell all you like. It doesn't matter. Um, so I'll try to make that clear as to how to save a little extra, depending on which which group you're in. Excellent. Where Thank you, you. Where you position that. Yep. Yeah, so Tony, I have a question. Yeah, um, so this morning I read uh, uh, the Fed temporarily eases capital requirements for big banks. Uh, it eases uh, supplementary leverage ratio to address the strain yeah. on the treasury market. So that provides the banks the, the money to buy the treasuries? Is that... Is uh, that the, the, um, the, the, no, the... Change they made is they're not counting treasuries as uh, a risk because they can put it in repo indefinitely. So it's allowing the banks to, uh, to because you know I think the banks has all these deposits from all its clients. Well, they're having to keep a large percentage in dollars, not treasuries, but dollars, to protect all their deposits, so that they're not loaning out too much money versus uh, what they have in the books. So the change is that now the Fed saying uh, you can borrow out, you can lend out every dollar uh, that's a treasury as if it were a dollar. So essentially the Fed's done everything you could possibly do to make the TLT go up is the bottom line. They've done it. Uh, so they've created a repo for foreign central banks so they don't have to sell treasuries to get dollars. They've created Forex swap lines for central banks so they can get uh, easy access to, to dollars. Um, they've created a repo, which is not being used because everybody just dumped all their, I don't think anybody has treasuries now. Uh, so they cleared their books out uh, with the trillion, you know, the Fed added a trillion dollars to the balance sheet. That was 100% bonds. 
And so now, you know, this is what comes next. Uh, now, this is surprising. If you listen to all the talk, he's always talking about selling this on the on the 30 year and that they're going to open up a 20 year. Uh, but they that's tiny and they only do this once a month. So they've really loaded up the front end of the yield curve. So it'll be interesting to see how much of this the Fed picks up versus foreign investors. If foreign investors are going to buy this debt, then that tells me they think these are going to negative yields. Because why would you buy a T-bill with, uh, look at the interest rates on these, 0 0.03, 0 0.09. So the government likes selling this debt. I mean, they're raising, what is this, uh, 160, or uh, rather 140, 194 to uh, like $320 billion to, uh, in the next week at near 0% yield. I mean, what the hell? Who would buy that? Only someone who thought that these were going to go negative or the Fed who just doesn't care. Um, so we do know the Fed's picking up a lot of this. It'll be interesting to see how much of that 320. So, so we'll, that's one of the key things we'll be watching is who's buying this debt. Um, but because now there's a repo market for central banks to, to access, not just U.S. So Fed is really supposed to be a, a bank authority for the United States, not for the world. But the problem is the dollar runs the world economy. So that's what continues to become a, a bigger and bigger problem is this shortage of dollars globally. So now central banks around the world can buy treasuries and then hand it over to the Fed for repo and get cash. And then they're gonna hope that these yields go lower so they can flip those bonds for a profit. Um, so all the actions the Fed has made make it extremely attractive to buy US debt. Um, so that's the bottom line on that. Uh, Ron says, can I add the QQQ put? Uh, that was our bootcamp trade and I wouldn't add it today, Ron, because we already have these puts. So you've got a whole nice slot of puts um, on the spy. So I think you're such a jet on, on downside. Plus you're long the TLT. Our whole, this is not the risk parity strategy, which we did all of last year. My basic ideas that that has broken down um, and that stocks are obviously going to have a lot of trouble because the economy has been really, uh, economy is gonna be put through a lot of stress. Uh, Mike says the trailer was much clearer today. Very good. Well, very, very glad that this is easier to read. Jack Tan says, is the GDX 400 shares per 75K? You got it, Jack. And you should have one married put per 100 shares of GDX. Very good. Yeah, this flow is way easier to follow. And I realize this is quite a bit of positions. So I'm going to slowly, uh, married put is the, is the reference to this. So if we just have a put, then you're just mm -hmm. long. You're long married your put. put. What put is that that I have to? Purchase. Right here. You see that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. So if you have, if you're longest stock and then you buy a put to protect it, they call that the married put. Okay, bye. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Very welcome. Hey, Julio, I see your microphone's uh, open, but do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just I thought you did. Cool. Okay, let me go ahead and look at some charts and some news. I'm not sure if we have Aaron on today or not, do we? Yep, he's in the panelist area. Oh, okay, good. Hey, Aaron, how's it going? Let's go ahead and let Aaron have the speaker. Hey, Jason, good. How about yourself? Oh, doing great. Good, good. Yep, I'm just on standby whenever you're ready. Okay, cool. I'm gonna go ahead and go through some charts and news and we'll pass the mic. All right, sounds like a plan. 
Excellent. I have a quick question. Oh, please. Yeah, one of the things that you just said, and you say it a lot, is to, to point out the discrepancies of what people think is going to happen and what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think a big tell that happened yesterday was the Trump um, presentation of 100 to 200,000 people dying. But on the same graph, he had 1.5 million to 2.5 million. So everybody right now is believing that that's going to be one to 200,000. And uh, I believe it's going to be somewhere around a million to 1.5. But my point is, is that how, how do we take advantage of that? Is there a way to take advantage of that, Jason? Oh yeah, that's what we're doing, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I also say that overnight after that meeting, they actually, if you look at the White House, um, the official information, they actually increased it to 240,000. So yeah. this thing is inching up, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and then Jason, while we're live here, we just crossed uh, 50,000 uh, global deaths too. Oh man, so sad. Yeah, so you know what, Pat, I actually think they're pretty accurate. If they do the 60 day lockdown and then give everybody a mask, which if you look at who they present, it's these manufacturers who are mass producing masks. Uh, they're already talking about how we need to wear masks. So I, I think we're gonna do a 60 day lockdown. If you listen to Bill Gates, it's, if you go back a few years, Bill Gates has some very telling interviews. It's just chilling to the bone. Uh, but he was telling everybody that he believed with 50% probability that there would be a global pandemic that would wipe out millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of people. Now, he's been telling everybody under the sun this for quite some time. Um, so, so, yeah, so what, what does the world need to do? They really have to shut down with a really strict lockdown. Bill Gates says 10 weeks. So let's go with Bill Gates. 10 weeks. What we're doing now is a joke. Right now is kind of like prepare for what's going to happen. So I think you've seen the administrations. Yeah, you know, they, they went from saying this is you have no risk. There's very low risk to it's going to get brutal. Watch out. So, so they're changing the, t the tone. I've just seen with my own friends, people were not ready to cope with this this concept that there's such a big risk floating around invisibly in the, in your own neighborhood and that you could end up in a in an ICU unit uh, with a 20% likelihood if you caught it. Just crazy talk. But now it's quite clearly here. And, and so I, I suspect we're going to do a 60 day to 10 uh, week lockdown. That's pretty harsh and then reemerge with masks. And I think you're gonna see the uh, log scale flatline, the economic damage be shortened and we get back to work sooner than, than maybe I had originally thought, um, which is good that if, if, if they do that. If they don't, then if they continue to do these quasi measures and let everybody just kind of go do whatever the hell they want, then it's not going to work. And, and I would agree that we're going to hit millions of deaths in the United States and, and hundreds of millions globally. Um, but if we do the 60 day lockdown and roll out some masks, uh, get the healthcare system a couple trillion dollars to deal with all the current sick people and mass produced ventilators, then, you know, we, we, we get through this a lot faster. Now it doesn't, mean we're going to go right back to sprinting pace the day after we open the economy back up. I don't think. Really that complex. Now maybe. And changing the way society, you know, the norms of society may be a lot more difficult than uh, what actually has to happen. Okay, let's go through charts and then we'll, okay, so dollar index, keep a close eye on. Okay, let's do 
Uh, it's, it's climbing. And this is with six trillion. This is with everything they could possibly do outside of, I, I don't know what else they could do. They've cut rates to zero. They've put unlimited capital into every financial system you could possibly dream of. Um, they're issuing massive debt. So the supply of dollars is increasing. The dollar index is still rising. So that's really bad. Here's S&P 500. Uh, we'll see if we hit some of our technical analysis buddies targets. So they're looking at 270. Um, I think it's possible, but I do think time is not on your side. So we've got some funny money in the system now, but the bad news is we got bad economic data for the next two to three months, almost no matter what. Oil market had a little bit of a bounce today. That's a positive for, uh, for a lot of companies, but will it be short lived? TLT had the blowout. We survived it, stayed course. Again, now we know that was big central banks selling that on top of Ray Dalio and everybody else. So outlook for TLT is uh, better than ever. We're backstopped by the Fed. Here's our 30-year treasury yield versus the German 30-year, uh, which has been a good leading indicator. So the more negative Germany's yield goes, uh, the closer to zero we can anticipate the 30-year treasury. And if this spread gets too tight, that would be a warning sign of perhaps a bounce. So you can see when it got tight here, we had a bounce. When it got tight here, we had a bounce. Um, so in general, I would like to see German 30-year crashing uh, to have confidence to maintain our position. Now, the caveat here is that China has taken the proper precautions to dampen down the economic problems from this honey badger virus. So uh, German, German's economy is highly tied to China. Uh, so unless America goes and starts wrecking havoc on China, which I think they will, uh, there is a chance that the US economy is in worse shape than the German economy. And so that relationship may not hold true. In emerging markets, which again does have exposure to South Korea, India, Russia, uh, a lot of countries in the candlestick chart. We can see FXI, the Chinese ETF, concentrated in their large cap construction insurance companies are outperforming. Those products are total garbage. Um, so I'm excited to short FXI with a put maybe next Tuesday. And again, I think there's a risk that this goes to zero on FXI, which means you would get the strike minus the premium paid on FXI. In the gold market, we're seeing a very important divergence right now. Will it be short-lived? We'll see. Uh, but again, that's to see that uh, gold is going up while stocks have gone down. We're seeing a little, um, little bit of a break in that correlation. Okay, here we have a few key currencies. Keep an eye on the Japanese yen showing some strength while all the other currencies are weakening. Um, so to see the dollar or the yen appreciate, uh, both of those are a bad sign for stocks. Okay, so now we're looking at crypto. And uh, interesting enough, cryptocurrencies have been a good leading indicator for the stock market. Now I'm not saying because crypto goes up, that the stock market will go up. But I do think that the same big players who are moving the stock market are also moving the cryptocurrency market uh, because it's such a smaller market cap. So we are seeing that uh, cryptocurrencies will bottom out or hit a top before the S&P 500 is. Uh, and that's signaling that big players are either buying or selling. So, um, I got out of the way of Ethereum for my son's account yesterday, and then it popped up today. So that's a bummer. But again, if we think the stock market's going to have a sell-off, then we don't want to be holding on to the super tiny market cap in the cryptocurrency. So in the boot camp, folks, we do hope to pick up some of these super cheap. And again, I would never have more than 1% of my total assets in cryptocurrencies if I was going into retirement but it does provide a nice uh, return. And uh, we've been endorsing that way back last December when it was 
uh, as low as 3,400, I think, on Bitcoin. And I think it was 90 on Ethereum, which shot up to 300 and back to 137 today. Okay, so let's look at some leading indicators. Here's those ETFs we're interested in that will create the walls to the house. Instead of the SPY, we're looking at XLV, IBB, IHI, ONLN, and ITA. So that's healthcare, biotech, medical devices, e-commerce, and then a defense military related uh, is ITA. And so um, they're trading very correlated. So that does tell me that uh, we don't want to buy these until we have that liquidation in the general market and we can get in for cheap. So those put options are sitting there uh, ready to generate profits all on their own, but they will also provide the, the hedge when we want to enter into this basket of ETFs. Okay, uh, yield curve slowly, but sh let me go to this one so we can see the progression. So we can see the yield curve was inverted, January, February signaling trouble ahead. Fed came in and dropped rates to uh, first emergency cut to uh, 50 basis points, then down to just above zero. And as expected, that's dragged the long end of the bond market down with it. Um, so to see that they're front loading the debt issuance on the T-bills uh, is interesting. Um, because that's what they've been aggressively buying at the Fed. So we'll see if this gets completely bought up by the Fed or if foreign uh, central banks are willing to, to pick up this tab, expecting lower negative rates. And if we get lower negative rates on this part of uh, the yield curve, then that's extremely good news for our 30-year TLT product. Here's a look at the debt issuance. So we got these huge auctions. We've been watching this daily, and this has just massively grown on the front end of the yield curve, which is odd because they were saying they were going to dump it all off on the 30 year, which was one reason I was hesitant to add to our positions in the last two weeks. I did want to see how much they're going to sell, and this is the normal amount, which is only typically sold once a month. So are they going to start ramping this up in May? I, I'm not sure. I'll keep a close eye on that. The logarithmic scale of the death count, I'm not really interested in how many uh, open cases anymore. I believe we're way beyond testing capacity. Uh, so the best leading indicator that the economic damage is going to slow down and begin a recovery phase will be when this goes flat. Um, so we've seen it go somewhat flat for several weeks at a time. Right now it's just taking off to the horse races. If we see this go flat for a 30 day period and then start to decline, I think that'll be right around when we wanna buy stocks as it will indicate that we have this at least temporarily under control. Now, does that mean we might get a summertime rally and then go back into some problems into the winter uh, because we get confident that we can open back up the economy? Um, we'll have to keep close eye on that. Okay. some. News I've collected. Here's some of the states, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, California, having the biggest increase in initial unemployment claims. I'm afraid this is just gonna get worse and worse as time goes on. Here was the announcement of the bonds being sold. Uh, this fellow had his House rate is trying to mark up N95 mass 700%, New York. Uh, now, a lot of these companies are seeing a short-term rush to stock up, but will that sales jump, drop for companies like Walgreens, Walmart, and Amazon? Maybe, uh, could, could very well. And plus, now a lot of the employees aren't so happy uh, working uh, and we're probably going to want to raises and, and things of that nature. So that's another reason I'm not jumping on the e-commerce bandwagon yet. Here's that shot of initial jobs claims skyrocketing. Um, it wasn't long ago, we we're looking at footage like this in China. Then I ran. Now it's Body bags piling up in Manhattan. 
Peter Schiff. I haven't had time to listen to his podcast lately. He's always a character. Of course, he only has one trade, which is always to buy gold, although he likes emerging markets, which has been hammered. Uh, looks like Chinese are getting smarter and will be buying oil instead of U.S. treasuries. Uh, I don't know about they still have a, about a trillion in treasuries and they still have to trade in either the euro or the dollar or the yen. Um, and so I don't think they've blown out the dollar yet to, to be making a transition, if you believe that China and Russia are trying to blow out the value of the dollar. Uh, talking about the New Deal playbook, uh, because the Fed did the global financial crisis. Uh, that's a great point. We'll have to do a whole uh, review of the New Deal, what that did for the economy and what the effects were long lasting afterwards. Uh, China keeps sending out all kinds of propaganda. They're pushing people back into their economy. Um, but again, they're wearing masks. They're super, super strict about all of that. Um, so I do think that is the, the key here, uh, which It'll be funny to see Americans change their ways. Uh, Paul has the TED Talk interview with Bill Gates um, talking about. Is that a new one, Paul, that just came out? OK, so we're starting to see the propaganda from the US side come out that China didn't tell us what's going on. And this is all their fault now. I believe they knew what was going on the entire time. I mean, if I could figure it out from here in Albuquerque, I'm sure they could with a $700 billion military budget. Probably by the time they figured out what had happened, it was too late to, to do anything. And I think they've been just urgently trying to get all the supplies we're going to need to deal with this um, and slowly baby stepping uh, the populace into understanding what's going on. If they had just told us everything at once, I think people would have had a meltdown. Hong Kong's home sales sank 40%. Uh, this is one trade I do like for a boot camp is to short the Hong Kong dollar. It's currently pegged to the dollar, so it's a super low risk trade. You really just have to pay the, uh, the Forex carry cost each to the swap cost each day, which is pretty minimal to hold that position. The bet is that China uh, either just gets rid of Hong Kong altogether uh, because it loses its status, which I believe uh, Europe and uh, North America could team up to accomplish that. Um, and that China might just move its exchange over to Shanghai or to Macau. So if that happens, Hong Kong goes into the drain, the real estate market tanks, their currency loses tremendous value. It either repegs to the yuan or uh, who knows, it could just go to zero. So either way, that is a trade I do like. The pressure's mounting. So... Uh, if I see the geopolitical talk get pretty intense, I'll probably issue a position on that for boot campers. And if that goes to zero, we're making something like, I'll have to review the slideshow, but uh, just an insane 100,000% return. Um, and the risk is really tiny, something like a 3% per year carry cost to hold that Forex position. Now it hasn't budged for 30 years, so, uh, it would take a significant geopolitical event, I believe, for that to pay out. But the risk to hold it's extremely minimal because of the way it's designed. Uh, Jack, in the boot camp, we have a whole module about shorting Hong Kong. And that one's really easy in a Forex account at Ameritrade or at Schwab. It's really if we wanted to short the Chinese currency that you need to go to interactive brokers. Now, I did not anticipate uh, the Chinese having a leg up on the United States. So I'm not ready to make that trade uh, because I think right now, obviously we're doing things to weaken the dollar, not strengthen it, even though the dollar continues to rise. Here's the- uh, Am I um, um, in TD Ameritrade? Uh, account when I open it, do I have to say anything about um, trading a Forex account or um, currency? Yeah, you will have to apply for a Forex account and you will have to actually move funds from the equity uh, 
from your normal trading account, which does equities and bonds, into the Forex account. Oh, okay. So um, I have to prepare for that then, huh, basically? Yeah, yeah watch the uh, module. It's one of the modules. There's a big two-hour presentation on what's going on in Hong Kong. And it's module it three. Module three, okay. What's the symbol for that? HKD. So risk is low. I mean, you could, this is only what till 2007, but it's been trading, you know, with extremely low percent change and because it's designed to match the dollar. It's designed to match the dollar. The, the big story is that uh, they have like 300 billion in U S dollars, but they have a cup like 1.3 trillion issued in the Hong Kong dollar. So if, if real estate prices start to collapse, everybody's going to freak out and try to make a bank run and, and that could collapse their currency. Uh, or China just stops protecting Hong Kong uh, because it might lose its special status. Uh, and again, that's their big hub for raising capital uh, from, from the rest of the world. So would they move it to Shanghai? They're already starting to move their markets to Shanghai. So it does look like, uh, and plus the riots just continue to get out of control in Hong Kong. There's just a lot of mess in Hong Kong. So it hasn't budged. You could sit there and lose 3% a year on the swap cost, uh, and then finally hit a huge payday if it, if it does pay off. Okay, here's a look at the oil uh, demand drop. Just got crushed. So uh, I think we're talking about buying a one-time purchase of, I can't remember. Regardless, I think the demand for oil is going to be low for the foreseeable future. So I don't want to buy into the gold rally today. Um, layoffs are going to continue to get worse and worse. Rent, real estate is another risky market now because if no one can pay the rent, um, that creates a lot of stress on all the banks. Here's the foreigners dumping 109 billion in that big drop we saw. Biggest monthly drop in history. And again, we had the right call. We bet on a down market in stocks. We didn't realize it would cause central banks to be uh, losing so much money that they would have to sell their good asset. Uh, so lesson learned. Jeffrey Gunlack, repo turmoil, September 17 was prologued. The junk bond J and K falling below its 200 day moving average was prologue. Money printing is on and not even being denied. With the Fed willing to monetize an unlimited amount of debt, sure hope the mile long lines at Costco aren't prologue. Oh, that's sad. I'm going to skip that one. Uh, so now we're seeing some geopolitical tensions with Iran, which of course will piss off. Russia and China. So this could be the start of what we're looking for for catalysts to do the Hong Kong trade. Um, so China's trying to get back to work, but they continue to go on and off of little lockdowns in small areas. Um, Okay, good. I think that's uh, okay. Americans must understand whether the US can control the pandemic entirely depends on themselves it has nothing to do with China. This is the basis on which the US adopts resolute measures to turn the tide. Stay strong, America. Uh, this guy's just sitting there trying to pick at us. Um, New York doctor says successfully treated 400 pa patients with the hydroxychloroquine and the z -Pak. Uh, but keep in mind, the recovery rate is something like 99% right now. So it's, it's not a blind test study. Uh, but again, that, that's not bad news, but it doesn't stop the flood of people getting sick. We can't get this to every, there's no way the next three months we can get this to every human being that's going to catch it. Uh, so it's going to continue to be a strain on the hospital system, but it, that's a good piece of news. Certainly if, if they can do a 
a real blind test and with probably more like thousands of people. Um, now in Italy, the death rate's more like 10%. So uh, it's curious why in Germany, you have extremely low death rate, but in Italy, you have extremely high death rate. Um, so we'll see what the US ends up at. But regardless, this does not change my prediction that we're gonna have dramatically slowed economic conditions uh, in America for the foreseeable quarter. So the next three months at a minimum, I think are gonna be very hard to swallow if you're trying to buy stocks. Uh, the Fed gave out $271 billion to corporate bonds. So you wanna know why the stock market's going up when unemployment is screaming higher. And it's dead obvious that we're gonna have lower profits and lower revenues for the foreseeable future. It's because the Fed gave corporations $271 billion, which they can go and buy their stock back. Uh, and corporation doesn't really care necessarily uh, if it's going to lose value, if the CEOs who own the company who are issuing the bonds can go in there and sell their stocks. So I believe that's what's happening is insiders are getting out and the Fed's helping, helping that, which is a crime, but that's what it is. Okay, great. I'm going to do a last round of questions and then we're going to hand this over to Aaron for some advanced tax secrets. Hey, Jason, Scotty. Hey, Scotty, how's it going? Doing very well, thank you. Hey, I haven't been on in a few days, um, but just following the trades, uh, I'm, I'm totally uh, on the trades, just really happy watching everything. Um, it pre pretty stable, but knowing that we're positioned you know, um, so that's good. Hey, on the, um, what your comment that you just said about the corporate, um, I did, I know you're probably tired of me thanking you for moving my money out of my 401k. <laughs> That'll never get old, Scott. That'll okay. never get old. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I, I just, I just love knowing that it's, in cash there, but I did move into, we had a couple of bond options. And at the time you said you are more in favor of treasuries. There was one that I was able to look at. It was half treasuries. It was a mix, but there were a lot of long-term treasuries in there in the, the 25 year range and, and so on. The oh, other, yeah. yeah, and it's doing well. I mean, I've got maybe 15% um, of my 401k in it. And every time I open it up, it's up $500 every day. So it's like, oh, that's nice. nice. Um, it is. I mean, I'm actually doing something. The other half of it, though, was in a mix of corporate. And you shied away from that um, just because uh, you didn't think corporate bonds were um, the way to go. So that's why I, I dipped my toe in it a little bit because at least it was half treasury. Um do you feel that the corporates uh, for this bond mix option that I have, do you feel a little more positive about the corporate? Well, the Fed is backstopping that uh, the investment grade bond ETF LQD. So that's probably why you got such nice bump in that. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you did really well with that. Okay. If, if the, um, it really depends. I know the Fed's going to keep the treasury market alive at all costs for sure. And it looks like they're willing to keep the corporate bond market alive at all costs too. Okay. Um, so I, I do like that considering that they did go in there and, and so I'm sure you've just been killing it on that. Good job. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to hold on to it then. Yeah, it sounds like it's the only good option you have. So I think, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Now, now, in general, do I think corporations are going to be healthy? No. Should they have more expensive debt? Yes. But uh, again, the Fed is allowing the uh, most reckless companies to keep borrowing at super low rates, and uh, investors are loving it. So I expect that will probably do pretty well for you here. Uh, especially mm -hmm. if, especially if we do the 60 day lockdown and get these things rolling again. Now, if this 
is too prolonged and the the, the books are just too ugly, uh, then I'd suspect the corporate bond market can have some trouble. Okay. Yeah, nice, Scotty. And then, hey, one thing I, I actually did this weekend with my sister-in-law is we, we went through uh, her, I think she only had like 20 options. It was crazy. Uh, but we went through, um, you know, her 401k and <clears throat> uh, instead, because there wasn't anything that was shorter term on her uh, options to pick from, we, we just went to a money market for her uh, for the time being. And <clears throat> uh, so, you know, just another alternative if, if there's nothing that's nothing else out there for just for all you guys out there she's lucky okay. she had that option <laughs> yeah and you know what, guys we might have to reschedule our boot camp lesson uh because aaron's got a lot of good content for you today so i may actually push our uh boot camp to be tomorrow after the uh the basic webinar okay so we don't have to cut off yeah. Aaron. just a heads yeah. up okay that'd be good okay great and we're going to be working on our spreadsheet. Uh, one thing I want to show you guys, this makes me smile. And also, I think I can have this out to you tomorrow. So that'll make more sense anyways. So check this out. You have the ETF here. I'm still testing it. The date here, the strike. And this little puppy's magically calling the open price. So we don't even have to have the contract code. Uh, so we can see our open P&L real time on all these option positions, which will be very, very nice. Uh, a couple of questions I have in the trade doc and then we will pass the mic to Aaron. Uh, okay, Didi, I, I do have the TLTs up on the screen. Does that clear? Jim Will says, any reason for the TLT to rise before the ninth? Yes, I think it'll be a slow grind uh, in general for the next two to three years, because that's how long I expect it to take to raise. It depends on how much they want to raise. So far it's 2 trillion. And you got to realize if we have a, our, our debt, our deficit is just going to blow out of proportion here as the tax receipts drop, as earnings drop. Um, so it's really bad. Uh, but because it's so bad, that's why we're so bullish on the, the treasury market, which I know it seems like the exact opposite, but that, unfortunately that's the way our Federal Reserve uh, manages problems. Instead of letting the bad actors go bankrupt, in, which in this case is US government, uh, which in this case is Boeing, which is in this case a ton of companies who wasted all their money on stock buybacks. Instead of letting these guys feel the pain and learn a lesson, what are they doing? They're giving them bailouts. So it sucks, but that's what it is. Uh, Connor says, why aren't you playing every bounce in the SPY in every direction? No, I'm just kidding. I don't believe the SPY will hit 270. Otherwise, I would. Uh, but I think it's possible. What I like to look at, Connor, is uh, risk to reward. So I'm highly confident that stocks will be traveling much lower over the course of time because we're going to have a reduced economy and the reduction in this economy is going to be caused by a 60 day shutdown, which will essentially take the uh, cardiovascular health of our economy and just wreck it. So if you could run a mile in six minutes before this happened, after this wrecks its way through, I bet we'll be running maybe a nine minute mile. So that's maybe a nine or 12 minute mile and slowly get back into shape, but it's not going to happen overnight and it's going to take a while to re recover from this. Uh, so I'm much more interested in trying to play trades that I have a extremely high confidence level on, and I'm picking the duration uh, that I believe is necessary to hit those targets. So uh, if you look at the trades, I believe we will crash below 220 before 619. I believe we could crash below 200 by 918. Uh, now, the longer we go out, essentially is in case the government really screws up. So if they just totally bosh this, they don't take the right precautions to, to solve the underlying problem, then I think this could last a lot longer. And so really for me to let go of this whole set of puts, 
I'm looking at a few things. I want to see this flat line and start to drop, which I think will mean we're closing in on the pain to the economy. Uh, that's one. And then two, I want to see that we essentially have rolled out either a vaccine, which a vaccination, which I think is highly unlikely anytime soon. So I'm not really counting on that. Uh, so really the best solution is everybody wears a mask. So if we get a 60 to 90 day global lockdown and reemerge with masks, I think that uh, that will give the healthcare system time to adapt for the manufacturers to create all the equipment we need and that we'll be able to essentially turn the engine back on. Now, it probably won't be running at full speed um, for years, but that could, could signal a bottom in the stock market. So if they really screw shit up, uh, then we might be holding these all the way into 2000, late 2021. If they make the right precautions and they do the right actions, um, I, I love to own the SPY. I love to own equities. So I really desperately want to get us back into equities, but not until I believe the, the, the disease causing the economic trouble has been cured. And so I think this short a significant strict shutdown, which essentially causes everybody has it to go through the life cycle. And now they're no longer infectious. And then we go back out with mass until a vaccination is created. Um, now does somebody have a vaccine they've already made and it's gonna roll out early and this is all some kind of crazy get rich scheme for biotech. You know, I don't know if that's the case or not. I hope so. That would cause me to go long sooner. But otherwise, I'll probably be selling this one uh, mid-May or late uh, or early June at the latest. Um, we'll probably be holding all these to about one or about one month of time premium left, most likely, uh, until we believe again the key cause of all this turmoil has been resolved. Okay, Tyler G says the bonus trade mentioned is part of the boot camp. Uh, yeah, boot camp does really speculative trades that use small amounts of capital and require a lot of patience. So uh, we bought a QQQ put, which had a huge return immediately. That's not usual. We bought a SLV leap, which is doing well. Uh, but we got a lot of time on that. And probably the next big trade will be uh, to short the Hong Kong dollar. I think that's a huge opportunity. Uh, Karen says, now you can add 50% of GE aviation to its unemployment. Oh, man. Yeah, so if you want to know why stock market's going up, it's because the Fed bailed out all the corrupt corporations who take advantage central banks and US debt. Uh, where's that? Oh, that's that one's awful. Okay, let's uh, Paul, go ahead. Uh, you have your hand raised, but your microphone is uh, muted so far. And last chance for questions, guys, and we're gonna pass the mic to Aaron. And again, I'm going to delay the boot camp to tomorrow because we're closing in on a new feature. I want to roll out your new spreadsheets. And um, I want to give Aaron all the time he needs. So you'll be able to go as long as you like today, Aaron. Sounds good. OK, anybody have any last questions for myself? Hey, Paul Sanchez, you sure you didn't have a question? I can't get your mic unmuted. Okay, and, and Jason uh, Barry just typed in, could you please explain the strategy behind the purchase of the TLT 164 strike again? Yeah. Uh, okay, let me pull up the trade. Okay, so this is our downside protection for our biggest asset currently held in the portfolio. So we currently have just over 40% of total assets managed. 
in that 30 year treasury, which uh, the TLT ETF is a proxy into this gigantic market. It's really the most liquid important market in the world. And uh, so the TLT is just a proxy for us poor folks to, to have access to. It's really the big banks and central banks that play the real bond market. So we just had an episode uh, where the big central banks, because of the oil crash and the stock market crash at the same time, they didn't have enough dollars to fuel their all the transactions their banking system required. So they ended up selling everything under the sun to get their hands on precious dollars. And that caused that massive sell-off in the TLT that was completely unexpected because usually the TLT goes up if stocks go down. Uh, so in case something gnarly like that happens again, we want to have downside protection. So this put essentially guarantees that you get no less than 164 per share of the TLT you own on this expiration date. So if the TLT dropped back to 140, it wouldn't matter. You get 164 per share. Now you're gonna lose the premium you paid for that put option, but that's your insurance. So uh, the reason we have a short duration Uh, Anwar says, why isn't he in the boot camp? Um, you should be in the boot camp, Anwar, for the 30-day trial. So everybody who buys gets a 30-day trial into the boot camp as a, a bonus. Um, so I'll, I'll see where you're at, Anwar. I know you've had a rough starting uh, trying to follow the system. So I'm going to go ahead and talk to Dean about giving you a little extra time in the boot camp if you are expired, okay? So Dean, if you want to look at that and discuss with Anwar, maybe giving him a little extra time in the boot camp. Okay, sounds good. Let you guys hey, look at what you... Yes, sir. Um, I thought you said four buy four per per hundred of that put one sixty four put. Uh, no. So here's your four. I know what you're talking about. That's the GDX. Oh, okay. Thanks. So this, this one's two. So the married put strategy is you just want to own one put per hundred shares. And that gives you absolute protection. So it's the married put. It's a very conservative strategy. Um, basically, you have to pay off your put with the underlying asset before the expiration to make money. So that's the downside to this put is that we have to pay off that put option cost by the TLT appreciating. Um, but the good news is if something horrific happens, which I don't anticipate, but if it did, then we get no less than the strike of our put. So if I buy the 164 TLT put, I think we'd pay like a buck 50 or something like that. Then I get 164 per share. I lose the premium and the TLT could go to zero for all I care. It wouldn't matter. So that's the whole idea of the married put. So we only have two positions, TLT and GDX that are equities. And those are protected both with one put per hundred shares. So on GDX, we have no more than a risk of 1% till May 15th because of owning that put. Now the catch is we have to get well above 25 to make any money on that, um, which we're right at 25, so, so I'm about break even on that. Uh, so if we go to 27 by May 15th, I'm making a nice profit and I had very little risk to, to accomplish that. So I love the married put uh, for, for trading because it limits risk. It's exactly the tortoise. You're the tortoise is gonna make it through the finish line with very little volatility. And you know, if you guys notice, I don't make huge, we had, how many times have you seen me have a double digit return? for like 48 hours. So I'm not trying to do that. What I'm trying to do is not lose money. And the track record shows that we do a damn good job at not losing money. So we're not trying to get rich. We're totally the tortoise. We don't want to have drawdown. We want to have low risk, controlled risk management. So the married put, it's a huge drag on your return when you're winning. Uh, but man, when something goes wrong, when some, you know, they call it the, the white swan now, but when a black swan hits that no one anticipated, you're glad you have those that protection. 
You have a question, Connor? Yeah, I do. Um, so you, you clearly know about the FDA uh, phase trials. The, when you talk about having a vaccine sooner, I'm sure you realize that there is, it's not possible at the FDA to have a vaccine before next summer. The phase one is going yeah, to I, is going to end sometime in the midsummer. Phase two is going to end at the end of next fall. Phase three wouldn't wouldn't end until sometime maybe around May. But what my question is for you is, you keep talking about how we could come up in sixty days wearing masks if if everyone adheres to this lockdown. But we know that many states are not. Florida, for example, even though they're in a shelter in place, is allowing uh, churches, synagogues, these mega churches to have full gatherings. And we also know that most of the countries in South America are not adhering to shelter in place, certainly not Brazil. They just, they just reported a case deep in the Amazon. Someone deep in the Amazon now has the virus. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you envision us coming up in 60 days without us closing the borders of allowing more people in and and bringing the virus back. And then the last thing I wanted to add is I live in Las Vegas. So our city is entirely tourist based. Casinos run the city. Every shop in the city, other than the marginal shops outside of the of the area of the strip, are based on the commerce of casinos. And casinos get their profits from people flying in from other states and other countries going to these concerts and having mass gatherings. I simply cannot envision these casinos opening up before they have a vaccine. I so, love it, so Connor. I, uh, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, so that, so the only thing I'll say is, is that look at where I put your put options. Okay, yes, I see them. So yeah, I agree with you, unfortunately. Now I'm hopeful that uh, so why, you know, so why, why do I think, so we are seeing them baby step, they're baby stepping towards what needs to happen to save the most money possible. Because you're right, if they, if they don't do a hardcore global synchronized shutdown, that's at least 60 days and make the whole world, which I agree, we can see riots all over the damn place. They're going nuts, especially in poorer countries. So yeah, to solve this is very complex. Um, to simplify it though, I think the whole world has to do a big shutdown and then reemerge with masks. And we have, a, have to have a pretty crazy amount of uh, enforcement. So China's the example that shows it works on a small scale. Okay, so yeah, is that realistic? I don't, I, that's why I have put options all the way to 2022. That's why I'm waiting for this to flatline and go down for over a month period. Uh, so we'll see if these governments can coordinate and pull this off. I mean, the, the chaos that's gonna, all the people feeling that they've lost their constitutional rights. It's, I agree with you completely, Connor. So. I'm not positioned for us to have a recovery in 90 days. Let's just say that. I'm on the lookout for a potential recovery beginning uh, at least the hitting the, cl the climax of how bad it's gonna get, I think could potentially be achieved in 120, in four months. So I think in four months, it's possible that the logarithmic scale of the death count flatlines and starts to maybe go down, which doesn't mean the deaths are decreasing, it just means the growth of the, the exponential growth of the deaths are increasing. Uh, if you look at it linear, I mean, it's just going straight up like a rocket. Um, so yeah, I agree with you, Connor. This is a very ugly situation. The TLT position will go up as long as the stock market's going down and the government's having to bail out everyone. I believe, again, that's because of the Fed manipulating this market, but that, that's in general. TLT goes up during recessions as government blows out deficits and stocks get crushed because all the money flows into the TLT. So I have this position to, to do well from a 
multi-year stock crash. Now, do I hope that we can not go into a Great Depression? Absolutely. And um, so I don't want to come across as a perma, a perma bear uh, and unwilling to open my eyes to a recovery or, or trying to figure out where we can safely enter the market. But you made a lot of great points, Connor, and I don't disagree with any of them at all. That was very well said. Thank you. Ernest says, let's get started with Aaron. <laughs> all right, Ernest wants to save some tax money. Any last questions before I uh, hop over to Aaron, guys? Uh, Anwar says, is GDX put is losing lots of money, but your GDX is making lots of money because it's a married put strategy. Let's just review that one more time. So the put options, we hope do what? Who knows what we hope our put options do in the crowd? Let's see who's taking good notes. Go to zero. <laughs> go to zero. Yes. Good job, Roy. So we want our puts to go to zero. That means our underlying <laughs> asset made a bunch of money. The, the more money you lose on your put means the more money you made on the underlying. Good question, Anwar. Okay, any other questions before we hop over? Uh, here's our legal disclaimer. Let's throw that up before we flip over. Okay, last chance for questions from me, guys. And again, we're going to push the boot camp to tomorrow. And we did get a new feature I'm testing today. Yeah. And we're going to roll out some nice sheets that automatically read out your option values, which is going to save me like 20 minutes a day. And I'm sure it'll save you guys a lot of time too. Nice, Jason. Uh, do you have <clears throat> do you have your um, uh, your transition slides too? You know, it's just a slide for Aaron. Uh, Aaron does such a great job. I'm just gonna <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, take over. I think I can handle it. Yeah, Aaron's got it. Go ahead and take the screen, Aaron. Thank you so much, and I hope you uh, enjoyed watching our little show. And we always can't can't wait to see your information. All right, sounds good. Much appreciated, Jason. All right, everyone. Hope everyone is uh, having a fantastic Thursday. Uh, my name is Aaron Sofer. I'm a, a senior attorney with Anderson Business Advisors. Let me go ahead and uh, get my screen up here. There we go. All right. And so, yeah, today I want to take the next hour or so and talk to you all about some very important strategies that are applicable across the board to all investors. Um, but most specifically, I'm gonna tailor this presentation for you as traders, okay? Uh, so at Anderson Business Advisors, we are a uh, nationally recognized law firm. We have offices in Washington, Nevada, and Wyoming. We've been around since 1999. We specialize, our specialty, the vast majority of our 15,000 clients are small business owners, real estate investors, and stock traders. And us as attorneys and business advisors, strategists, we are all engaged in these very activities ourselves. And so for the next hour, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about some very important fundamental strategies as to how to both protect your assets and reduce your overall tax liability. Right, there's that old saying, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep, right? So overpaying in taxes can almost be just as punitive as say getting sued in your personal capacity and then having to pay out of pocket for a judgment, okay? So I'm gonna talk about how to protect against those occurrences, again, overpaying in taxes and losing your assets in a lawsuit. And then what I'm gonna finish today's presentation on is a, a very important topic, especially given the times that we're in right now, right? Facing a pandemic, a lot of us are quarantined to our own homes, uh, and that's estate planning, okay? Estate planning that is taking control of how your assets are gonna be distributed when you pass away. I, I hate to break it to you, it's not if you pass away, it's when you pass away, right? There's no U-Haul that's being tugged uh, behind a hearse. You don't get to take those possessions with you when you're no longer here. So the most prudent thing you can do while you're living is again, take control of how your assets are gonna be distributed once you do pass away. So I'm gonna talk about some very important elements pertaining to estate planning uh, to wrap up the, the hour long here. 
All right. Uh, so in addition to being a law firm, Anderson, we also do have our own in-house uh, CPA uh, firm, if you will. We acquired a tax division about 10 years back uh, because we realized that when we were giving legal advice to our clients and we told them, hey, go talk to your CPAs to make sure that they're on board with this, we realized that those CPAs, there's a wide disparity, uh, a, a gap in knowledge between the CPAs uh, that weren't involved in these types of endeavors that is investing whether in the stock market and real estate just a, a, again an overall large gap in knowledge so at anderson we went out and we acquired a tax firm we now have our, our in-house capabilities to take care of all of our clients uh, from a to z whether legal or tax related and then lastly we also do uh, retirement planning so uh, i'm not going to spend it really any time with regards to insurance but insurance is an incredibly important piece to any comprehensive asset protection structure, okay? And so typically, and I'm not talking about term insurance where you, you know, get a, a term life policy for 15, 20 years, which 99% of those expire worthless. And then the 1% that do cash in, that means you die, okay? No, I'm talking about whole life policy. <laughs> Feedback. Okay, there we go. All right. um, so just continuing on here um, with regards to asset protection. All right. The first thing that you have to be cognizant of is who you're getting your information from. All right. Just like you put your trust in Jason and the team at Portfolio Builders to guide you in the right direction with regards to investing in the markets. Um, it's, you can compare that similarly to somebody who's going to build a house, right? If you're going to be doing the electrical wiring in the house, you better have a licensed electrician take care of that for you. You want to depend upon those as to that is their high value area. That is their expertise, right? Just like you wouldn't hop on a plane that wasn't piloted by a licensed pilot. Same thing goes for asset protection. You want to put your trust, your faith in those who that is what they do. All right, so you know, there's a lot of asset protection gurus out there online, YouTube University, whatever it may be, where you know it's a kind of a one size fits all. Now, I'm gonna level with you. I'm not hating on these guys one bit. I can only hope that when we come out of quarantine, I look half as good as any one of them. Okay, uh, but <laughs> to that effect, uh, asset protection is not a one size fits all type of endeavor. Okay, there is a unique set of circumstances, facts and circumstances that applies to each and every one of you. And so with that being said, what I'm going to do during this presentation, obviously I can't tailor my presentation to each one of you that is in fact uh, tuning in today, but what we're going to do is there should be a link in the chat box and you can utilize that link, click on that link and you can schedule a free consultation with one of our business advisors or with one of our strategists uh, to go over your unique individual circumstances based on what we're going to cover here in the next hour or so, okay? And so, uh, again, knowledge, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is knowing that you don't cut up a tomato and put it in a fruit salad, okay? So it, there's, a, again, we're talking about the gap in knowledge and how to apply that knowledge. Um, you want to put your faith in somebody that is, in fact, doing what you are doing yourselves, okay? And so uh, when it comes to asset protection and tax mitigation, uh, it's important to understand uh, the base elements, the, those basic fundamental concepts when it comes to legal liability, okay? Because at the end of the day, uh, legal liability, that's one surefire way that you can effectively have the reset button forced upon you in that if you are sued in your individual capacity, you don't have any asset protection, then let's say you have a brokerage account in your own name. Guess what? That is one of the most juicy looking pieces of fruit, if you will, that a plaintiff's attorney can go after. Uh, prior to joining Anderson Advisors three years ago, I was doing general civil litigation here in Las Vegas, as based out of our Las Vegas office. And uh, when I was doing general civil litigation, again, that's a lot of what I did. I sued business owners, individuals, defendants on behalf of my clients, okay? My clients were aggrieved. And so when my clients would come into my office uh, as a plaintiff's attorney, 
it, the first thing I would do is qualify the defendants for a lawsuit, right? You're not going to sue a defendant that doesn't have any assets to go after. So as a plaintiff's attorney, the first thing that we did after meeting with our uh, potential client was in fact do an asset search on that defendant to ensure that uh, that defendant was in fact worth suing, okay? And so when it comes to lawsuits, this is an example of an advertisement that asset locator search firms put out there, right? We find debtors assets. And as an attorney, that is exactly what I want uh, for, in order to, that's the type of business that I want to utilize in order to qualify any potential defendant for that lawsuit. Because any asset that's owned by that defendant is something that me as a plaintiff's attorney can go after to get some recourse for my plaintiff that was aggrieved in some capacity. Okay, some of the biggest ways that we as individuals are going to be subject to liability uh, include personal injury. So think of it this way. When we leave our house, hop in our car to drive to the grocery store, because we shouldn't be driving anywhere else right now. Uh, so, so when we hop in our car, we're inherently incurring a, a little bit of liability, a little bit of risk. Okay, that's why it's mandatory that we carry vehicle insurance, automotive insurance, is so that when... It, if we're involved in some sort of liability creating event, let's say we rear end somebody and we're 100% at fault, well then that victim of the car crash is then going to sue us individually for causing that car crash and for any damages that ensued from that incident, okay? Now you may be saying, yeah, that's exactly why we have insurance. Correct, but is insurance alone enough? The average personal injury policy, or sorry, personal injury judgment verdict is about $1.2 million right now. Average insurance coverage, not even half that much. It's roughly about 500,000. So in those instances where even if we have insurance, we are still liable for, a, uh, for damages that exceed our insurance coverage, we individually are going to be liable for that difference in that uh, amount, okay? So again, average in, uh, insurance coverage, 500,000. Average verdict, jury verdict, 1.2 million. So our insurance coverage, yeah, it'll cover the first 500,000 theoretically in that instance, but then what happens with that excess $700,000 from that judgment that that plaintiff obtained? Uh, who is then liable for that deficiency judgment, that remaining 700,000? You guessed right, it's going to be you individually. And so any asset that you own in your personal name is going to be subject to that claim. So again, if you have a brokerage account in your personal name, vehicles, business interests, anything in your personal name is then going to be subject to that verdict that that plaintiff obtained, that judgment, okay? Uh, additional threats, uh, property ownership. So uh, again, I know most of you guys are invested in the market here, but there's a big crossover. Uh, again, we talk about diversifying your portfolio and whatnot. And uh, I, again, we have over 15,000 clients, the vast majority of which yeah, they're invested in both the markets and in real estate. And so, again, just another example of liability is property ownership. Again, you own that asset, the, the rental property in this case. If you have tenants, huge source of liability, any sort of slip and fall or other liability creating event, the property owner is going to get sued. Uh, this is another big one, actions of children. Uh, so, yay, we love our children, uh, but they're huge sources of liability. And every state has laws on the books that impute the actions of children to parents. It's called the family purpose doctrine. And so again, if we're not structured, even if you say, okay, well, you know what? I never leave my home. I, I do all my stock trading from, from my uh, home office upstairs. I rarely leave. So, you know, and I'm not really going to incur a lot of liability uh, out and about in the community, in general public. Well, don't forget if you have children, their actions can be imputed upon you as well. Um, and again, some other threats, contract claims, uh, loan defaults, banks. Uh, so again, if you personally guarantee a loan, let's say a, a student loan for a, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, a son, a daughter, uh, if you personally guarantee that loan and that borrower defaults on the repayment, guess who's liable? Again, you individually and the bank can then come after or the lender then can then come after any asset that you own in your personal name. So again, if you haven't caught on thus far, the key here is, and this is just a slide illustrating that uh, $1.2 million judgment versus average insurance coverage, but the key here is 
who don't want to own anything in our own name, okay? Now, how we achieve that general principle is instead of having those assets titled in our personal name, we're gonna transfer title to say that brokerage account. And instead of maintaining that brokerage account in our personal name, we're going to set up uh, business entities to engage in that action, okay? And so now business entities, they're what's going to provide us a, a multi-pronged protection, okay? Both from assets and the liability that we create uh, that could potentially affect our assets. And then also on the tax mitigation side, okay? So again, I know I've been talking, uh, starting off here with uh, just general asset protection uh, rundown, but I, I wanna also impress upon you that these business entities are in fact used for both of those uh, aspects. Again, reducing asset uh, or reducing liability, personal liability, as well as tax mitigation, okay? So when it comes to reducing our overall tax burden, and uh, there have been some monumental shifts in our internal revenue code in the past couple of years, uh, just back in 2017, December, uh, with the passage of the Tax Cutting Jobs Act, uh, that was the largest overhaul of our tax code in a, a few decades, okay? And so there were some material changes that I'm going to discuss uh, in the next uh, half hour or so with you guys. All right, so when it comes to reducing our overall tax liability, there are some general uh, tax mitigation principles that we employ, all right? And the first one being is income shifting, all right? Uh, and income shifting, the big difference between income shifting and uh, tax avoidance, all right? Tax avoidance, perfectly legal. But when we start using that E word, tax evasion, that is a no-no, all right? So income shifting, AKA tax avoidance, perfectly acceptable under the Internal Revenue Code. If you don't want to take my word for it, you could take my word, or the word of these judges, okay? The, and by the way, how awesome of a name of a judge is that learned hand? Uh, he said, anyone may so arrange his affairs that his taxes shall be as low as possible. He's not bound to choose that pattern which will best pay the treasury. There's not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. And then Justice Rehnquist on the Supreme Court said, there's nothing wrong with the strategy to avoid the payment of taxes. The Internal Revenue Code doesn't prevent that, okay? So again, if you don't wanna take my word, take the judge's word for it. There is nothing wrong with putting together a strategy to avoid the payment of taxes, okay? Uh, politics aside, our president, just the prime example of utilizing business entities, multiple taxpayers to reduce his overall tax burden. And when I say multiple taxpayers, well, all of us as individuals, we are our, all individually a taxpayer, but we can also create business entities such as LLCs and corporations, which are also separate taxpayers. And when we create those separate entities, we already know the parameters that those separate entities are working within, all right? So for example, when we create a C corporation, uh, and I always laugh when I talk about C corporations in this respect, because back in 2012, I don't know if any of you guys remember, uh, Mitt Romney got absolutely panned uh, by the media when he made the statement, corporations are people too. But he, one, he's 100% correct. Corporations actually have personhood under our code of laws in the United States. A corporation has personhood, it, it can make charitable contributions. It even pays its own tax rate on the income that it generates in a given tax year. Uh, so pursuant, as I mentioned, the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, it was a major overhaul. One of the biggest areas that it overhauled was the corporate tax code, okay? C corporations, previous to the uh, tax overhaul, corporation, C corporation tax rate ranged zero all the way up to, it, I think it's 38, 39%. Um, so again, range between zero and 38, 39%. After the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, revised down to a single flat rate of 21%. Okay, and that affords us some planning opportunities. Uh, so I know some of you may live in very high tax jurisdictions, California, New York, Massachusetts, Virginia. I mean, there are high tax jurisdictions all throughout the country. And if you are a high income earner in one of those jurisdictions, I mean, if you're married filing jointly and if you earn roughly over 600,000, uh, those dollars that you earn in excess of 600,000, maybe 630,000, 
um, those dollars that you earn in excess of that threshold amount, those are going to be taxed at between federal and state. If you earn those dollars individually, roughly about 50%. Uh, I know that's the case in California, where again, I'm talking about individual. So our individual tax brackets, uh, marginal tax rates range between zero and 37% now, okay? So again, if you're a high income earner, federal tax rate, highest rate, 37%, and then you tack on the tax rate, uh, the state tax rate, which in uh, many states, you know, the highest rate, somewhere between 10, 13%. So again, you are effectively paying 50 cents in taxes on every dollar that you earn in excess of those amounts. So what we're able to do now is utilize these separate taxpayers, again, these corporations that pay tax at its own rate, and we can do income shifting. We can have certain items of income earned by, say, a corporation, when otherwise, if they were earned by us, we're going to be paying almost double the tax that we would should those dollars be earned by the corporation. And the, the nice part about it is when we create these corporations, these separate taxpayers, well, we still own and control these corporations, okay? And now even better, uh, even better than earning those dollars in our personal capacity where we're limited in the amount of deductions that we can take, a corporation has the widest latitude to take business deductions under the tax code, okay? It should come as no surprise, especially in light of the Tax Cutting Jobs Act. Again, the vast majority of the tax benefits of that tax act were afforded to corporations. And you don't have to be a Fortune 500 company in order to take advantage of those tax mitigation principles. No, all you need is a corporation. And any one of us can go and set up a corporation um, with or without help. Now, again, this, that relates back to, you know, do you want to practice self-help? No, there's great, uh, I, I use that term loosely, great. Uh, it all depends how you use it. It's kind of a double-edged sword, but there are, you know, websites such as Rocket Lawyer, Legal Doom, sorry, Legal Zoom, uh, where, you know, it, it's that's that self-help remedy right there, and you are essentially playing with fire if you don't get the appropriate guidance when you try and utilize that self-help. Okay, so now as traders, uh, the specific tax concerns that we should all have when we're trading in the market are we have to be aware of uh, the NIDI tax, the net investment income tax. That's an additional 3.8% that's assessed on all trade related income, all investment income. So that tax additional 3.8% uh, is assessed if you're a single individual earning over $200,000 in investment income. And if you're married filing jointly, that extra 3.8% is assessed uh, if you earn over $250,000 married filing jointly, okay? Uh, additionally, if we're trading out of our own name, all our individual trades must be reported on 8949. And on top of that, the IRS, they tell us where they look for audits, okay? And if we are conducting business out of our own name, rather than out of a formalized structure, such as a business entity, such as an LLC, a corporation, a limited partnership, uh, they are looking for us that conduct business activity out of our own name. because they are under the opinion, and it's not misguided by any means, that, hey, if you're just doing things on your own accord through your own name, chances are you're not keeping books and records. You're not otherwise adhering to the requirements under the tax code in order to substantiate deductions, okay? And so they are looking for those of us that, in fact, do business activity out of our own names. And so uh, other than the asset protection and general tax mitigation that we can benefit by operating out of a business entity rather than our own names, again, it just automatically raises our audit risk by conducting those activities through our own names as well. So when you are, I wanna focus right now on if you do have an account, a trading account in your own name, uh, you can continue to do uh, nothing, all right, and continue to trade out of your own name, but just keep in mind, you do not have asset protection. You are not going to have uh, any, you're not availing yourself to any of the benefits of the tax code, all right? You're very limited in the amount of deductions that you can take, all right? Uh, when you're trading out of your own name, all the uh, income is going to be unearned, meaning you can't otherwise make contributions to IRAs or 401ks, all right? And you can't take deductions for things such as educational seminars or um, uh, business expenses, generally speaking, okay? Uh, so that includes you don't get any deductions for computers, equipment, other trading related expenses. Uh, and then 
relating back to some changes pursuant to the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, uh, they did away with miscellaneous itemized deductions, okay? Meaning that for a lot of those deductions that you are now going to be missing out on, should you have, or had you have been writing those off on your Schedule A previously, the only way to still capture those deductions now in 2020 is to, in fact, have a business entity, have a corporation, and write those off on the corporation's tax return. All right. Uh, so, in addition to uh, just trading out of your own name, now there are there, there could very well may be a select few of you, and I say only a few, uh, that could potentially qualify as a trader. There is such thing as a trader status under the Internal Revenue Code, all right? It's a designation afforded by the IRS. And when you achieve trader status, uh, the, it effectively allows you to take business expenses without having to operate through a business uh, entity, whether a corporation, limited partnership, or LLC, okay? but it's a very high bar to attain. It is very difficult to achieve trader status. Um, effectively, to achieve trader status, you have to engage in regular and continuous trading activity. You have to seek to profit from short-term market movements. You actually have to keep a contemporaneous log. You have to log your time that you've spent on trading. Trading has to be your sole or primary source of income. And then lastly, and quite punitively, is if you're trying to achieve trader status, you can't rely on the opinion of others uh, in making your trading decisions, all right? And there are many court cases, tax court cases that challenge these very principles and the IRS wins almost every single time because again, it is just that hard to achieve this quote unquote trader status, all right? And so uh, again, effectively in, in summation, if you do achieve trader status, then you're able to write off those business expenses that you are otherwise precluded from writing off in your personal tax return. Uh, but you know, achieving this trader status at the end of the day, uh, we can even take a look at this one case right here on the screen for Nelson. He did 525 trades over 121 days, he even made a profit of 470,000. But the tax court came back and said that since she wasn't trading full time. Again, those 525 trades were only conducted over 121 days. She did another 325 trades over 66 days, but that's still roughly half the year. That those trades, even though you know over 800 trades in six months, that is not regular and continuous under the Internal Revenue Code, right? The IRS claimed that since those trades, albeit it was substantial during that six months, it was not routine and continuous over the entire tax year. And so Nelson was denied uh, trader status and then was precluded from writing off all those business deductions on his tax return. All right, so those deductions were disallowed and then he had to pay tax penalty and interest on those disallowed deductions. All right, so rather than trying to attain what is otherwise this mythological being as Bigfoot, all right, you could uh, just equate trader status to Bigfoot, you're not gonna be able to find it. You're not gonna be able to achieve it. What we can do, the solution here is again, utilize business entities, okay? Now we're gonna utilize corporations for the beneficial tax uh, implications that come along with them. Um, and we're gonna use the corporation in conjunction with another business entity type. So for those of you that maybe have been trading for a long time, you may, if you are already structured, you very well may be trading out of a limited partnership. The limited partnership for the vast majority of the last 50 odd years has been the trading structure of choice, okay? Uh, the limited partnership has simply been around for a long time, as opposed to limited liability companies, LLCs. Um, the first LLC statute wasn't adopted until the 70s, and then they didn't even become popular until the 90s, until there was uh, some established case law. So investors, judges, uh, and uh, attorneys knew how courts were going to treat LLCs. So it does take some time uh, for that body of case law to build up. So people know how these entities are going to be uh, interpreted in uh, whether in a, a legal lawsuit, a liability lawsuit, or in a tax mitigation uh, circumstance. So dealings with the IRS. Okay, so LLCs um, in the last 20, 30 years have become a lot more popular because they're a little bit more of a flexible entity type than limited partnerships, uh, but you can trade out of either one. And so how that operates 
is uh, you are no longer going to maintain the trading account in your own name. Instead, you are going to maintain the trading account in the name of that limited partnership or in the name of that LLC. Okay, so it is no longer you that owns that trading account that, that is the title donor of that account. No, it is this business entity that is afforded liability protection. Okay. And so let's uh, take this first example here where you have a limited partnership. There's a couple different uh, positions, if you will, within the limited partnership. So there's a general partner. The general partner is the uh, person or entity that's in charge of making all decisions, investment decisions on behalf of the limited partnership. The general partner, uh, that party, the earnings that are paid to that party, to the general partner, those are co that's considered active income, all right? And the general partner has unlimited liability for the debts of the limited partnership. So what we will do here is when we set up a limited partnership to conduct our trading through, we are going to use, let me get my pen here. Uh, we are going to use a corporation. Remember I mentioned before the corporations are afforded the largest amount of tax deductions under the tax code. So we're gonna use a corporation that we own and control as the general partner. Then as the limited partner, we can have us as individuals be the limited partner. And then typically when we set up a trading structure through a limited partnership, we'll assign 20% ownership of the limited partnership to the general partner, to the corp. And that means 80% is gonna be left over here to the limited partner, okay? And so then we take the example you see down there in the right hand corner, we have $30,000 of profit. Okay, so you have the brokerage account, brokerage accounts maintained in the name of the limited partnership, you make 30,000 profit in the year. All right, so since 20% of the limited partnerships owned by the general partner, that means that 20% of the 30,000 is going to be paid to the general partner as a management fee or as a just a guaranteed payment to partners. So that's going to equal 6k. And then that means the remaining 24K is going to be paid to the limited partner. All right. Now, the key here is the $6,000. This is how we're going to reduce our overall tax liability. As I mentioned before, income shifting between different taxpayers. So if we didn't have this limited partnership and we still had that $30,000 in profit, Okay, that means all 30,000 of that profit is simply going to flow down onto our personal tax return and we are paying taxes on all 30,000. But now that we've allocated 6,000 to be paid over to the corporation and the corporation operates under the corporate tax code and the corporate tax code has just a plethora of available business deductions that we otherwise can't take in our individual capacity, we're going to Excuse effectively me. be able to Can reduce- Can I ask a question? This. What was that? Can I ask a question? By all on means? The the 80% that go the 24k that goes to the limited partner is that taxed at uh, like regular income or is that taxed by the the trades that were done how is that taxed great question so yeah that 24k that's going to flow down into your personal return uh, that's going to depend on how long you held those positions so when you hold stocks as an individual that's it's a capital asset all right and if you sell that capital asset in under 1 year then that's what we call uh, a short-term capital asset. And when you sell that, the income generated from that activity is taxed at your short-term capital gains rate, which is your ordinary tax rate, okay? There are no tax benefits to selling a short-term capital asset, okay? Then if you, instead, if you held on to that position for longer than one year, now that is a long-term capital asset. And then if you sell that asset uh, again after one year, the income generated from the sale of that asset is gonna be taxed at your long-term capital gains rate. And that is truly where we then start to see some tax benefits because our long-term capital gains rates are preferred. They're either at zero, 15 or 20%. And where you fall on that scale is gonna be determined by how much overall taxable income you have in the given tax year. So let's say uh, you let's say this was a long-term hold. Okay, so you held this asset, the trades that generated thirty thousand in profit, you held for over one year and then sold it, generated this thirty k in profit. So then the twenty four k that is going to flow down to onto your return as the limited partner, that's going to be again taxed at either zero, fifteen, or twenty percent. 
All right. So for the vast majority of you, you're going to fall into the 15% long-term capital gains tax bracket. Uh, just ballpark figures. If you're married filing jointly and you earn roughly between 80 and I think it's about $480,000 in a given tax year, you fall into that 15% long-term capital gains rate. Okay. Uh, and again, those are rough numbers. Don't quote me on that, but it, they're, they're pretty close. All right. So again, most of you will fall into the 15% long-term capital gains rate. Uh, but with that being said, hey, if you did this trade uh, and you sold this in a tax year where you, if you're married filing jointly and you didn't really have any uh, income, you didn't have much income in that given tax year. So you're under that 80,000 threshold and you sold this uh, and you had this 24,000 in gain, it could potentially qualify for zero percent tax tax rate on that sale. So again, knowing how the tax rates are applied and just doing some tax planning, you can really take a hold of your overall effective tax rate. Okay. Um, and so uh, great question, by the way. And so now uh, as it pertains to, again, the 6K that's paid over to the corp, that's income to the corporation, but now we're going to be able to expense it out using the, again, plethora of tax deductions that are available to corporations, which we will cover in just a moment. Okay, so this is how we would trade out of the limited partnership. As I mentioned, LLCs have kind of became more popular just because they're a little bit more flexible, um, but they operate in vastly the same way, all right? But instead of a general partner and limited partner, you have a manager, okay? So the corporation and an LLC would be the manager manager and then the individual would be the member okay that's the only difference when we're talking about the different positions between an llc and a limited partnership but the division of income works roughly the same actually exactly the same okay in that we have the same thirty thousand profit uh so let's use the same ownership splits so 20 percent so at 6K gets paid down to the uh, manager as a management fee and the remaining 24K goes over here to the individual as the member, okay? So again, a lot of flexibility, a lot of similarities between the two entity types. The main point at the end of the day is that no longer is the brokerage account maintained in your personal name. It is instead owned, the brokerage account is owned by these entities these limited partnerships or LLCs that also incorporate the use of a corporation for the tax benefits, uh, but the limited partnership and the LLCs are what actually affords us the asset protection. So that way, if we're ever sued in our individual capacity, again, we're driving down the street in our car, we rear end somebody, they get that $1.2 million judgment against us individually. Well, if we've set up our uh, business entities, our limited partnership or LLC in the appropriate jurisdiction, well, no longer is that brokerage account an asset that we own in our individual name. And so then that holder, that plaintiff holding that uh, judgment against us in the amount of 1.2 million, let's say insurance kicks in 500,000. So they're still coming after us for the $700,000 in deficiency judgment. Even if you had a million dollars in your trading account that's owned in this LLC, well, I just mentioned it. That's the key factor there is this million dollars is owned by the LLC. The million dollars is not owned by you individually. All right. And so we'll talk a little bit about what charging order protection is in just a few moments, but that is one of the key factors that if, and this is why we jurisdiction shop is set up business entities in certain jurisdictions, because I mean, as we all know, with just laws in general, laws vary from state to state. And there are strong states and good states to set up business entities in. And then there are really bad states to set up business entities in. And again, we'll, we'll talk more about charging order protection and those concepts in just a few moments. Uh, but I do want to talk and take a look at some of the deductions that you can take using your corporation, okay? So some of those deductions include uh, your data feed, subscriptions, uh, if you buy business equipment, you're able to depreciate that using Section 179 depreciation, where you can buy up to a million dollars in equipment and depreciate it all in year one and generate a big upfront deduction, uh, so long as you have the requisite income to use that deduction to offset. Uh, internet, travel, automobile reimbursement, that's a key one, because no longer can you write off 
the personal use, or sorry, the business use of your personal vehicle on your personal 1040. That used to go on your Schedule A miscellaneous itemized deductions. We don't have that anymore. Tax Cut and Jobs Act did away with Schedule A miscellaneous itemized deductions. So the only way to now get reimbursed for the business use of our personal vehicle is by running that as a reimbursement through our corporation. Okay, additionally, your startup costs, organizational costs, trading seminars. So let's say you spend $5,000 for the pro package in portfolio builders. If you incur that expense in your personal capacity, that is a non-deductible expense on your personal 1040. Publication 529 goes through, uh, IRS Publication 529, I think it's on page four or five, it stipulates no deductions for investment-related seminars, okay? So what the only way to capture that expense and make it a deductible expense is by running that as an expense through the corporation, okay? Again, corporations operate under a vast, vastly different set of rules than us as individuals, separate chapter of the tax code. All right. And so our corporations, they're allowed to take startup and organizational costs. Uh, and so we will essentially recharacterize that fee that was other pay, otherwise paid uh, for an investment related seminar. We just recategorize that as a startup expense of our corporation, which is permissible under the tax code. And now we've taken a non deductible expense and converted it into a deductible expense. And remember what that $6,000 of income paid to our corporation. Right? Well, we are going to take deductions against that $6,000. So again, $6,000 paid to the corp. And let's say, again, we have a $5,000 education expense paid to uh, portfolio builders. Then we incurred $2,000 of travel expense related to our business and uh, $1,500 of computer and equipment expense. So that's $8,500 in expenses. If we did not have a corporation, those would all be non-deductible expenses to us in our individual capacity. But since we set up a corporation, and we can set it up after the fact, okay, simply because you already have your brokerage account and already trading, that doesn't mean you are now precluded from incorporating the use of a corporation in your investing. We can certainly create it now, but the sooner the better, because we can only go back so far and capture some of those expenses that you incurred pre-incorporation and otherwise be able to wrap them as an expense under the corporation, okay? So the sooner the better. Uh, but let's continue on with this example. So you incurred these expenses personally. Uh, so let's say you started your corporation today, but you had already in, in, incurred these expenses previously. Again, we're still able to capture those as expenses under the corporation. All right. And what we're going to do is simply have our corporation reimburse us for, again, we had $6,000 of income from that $30,000 in profit that we uh, covered on the previous example. So our corporation is going to be able to reimburse us that $6,000. And so that otherwise uh, reduces our overall uh, debt as it pertains to those expenses to 2,500. And since that reimbursement is in fact a reimbursement, it is not income. Meaning that we, when our corporation reimburses us for that expense that we incurred on behalf of our corporation, because our corporation simply hadn't made money when we incurred these uh, $8,500 of expenses, right? We incurred those expenses pre-incorporation but then we went out there, started conducting business. We generated revenue our corporation. Our corporation is then able to reimburse us for those business expenses that we incurred using personal dollars prior to our corporation being able to uh, cover those expenses itself, okay? And so again, we can utilize these uh, entities, limited partnerships, uh, LLCs, corporations, they all um, impact our asset protection, but again, utilized also for the tax mitigation principles. Okay, so uh, with charging order protection, that's what I mentioned before, if we jurisdiction shop and set up the LP, uh, the limited partnership or the LLC in the correct jurisdiction, we can prevent our personal creditors from being able to take our business entities from us. So a weak jurisdiction like California, if we set up this trading structure in California, so we set up a limited partnership in California, or let's use an LLC. We set up an LLC to do our trading, uh, to hold our trading account in that LLC set up in California. And then we, the same as scenario where, hey, I, I go down, I'm driving down the road, I rear end somebody, they get that $1.2 million judgment against me. Insurance picks in 500K, but then uh, judgment creditor still has a $700,000 deficiency judgment against me individually. Well, California state law allows for my judgment creditor 
to effectively take my LLC interest from me, okay? Because California does not have charging order protection as a sole remedy in its state's laws. Whereas if we go to states like, um, let's see here, if we go to states like Wyoming, Nevada, and Delaware, which not only have very strong charging order protections, uh, but also allow for anonymity. So in a state like Wyoming, we can go set up an LLC and the state of Wyoming, they don't even publish who in fact owns that LLC, right? If you go to the secretary of state and type in the business entity name. So let's just say I call my trading uh, entity, um, just a XYZ LLC, all right? And somebody wants to go see who owns XYZ LLC. They go to the secretary of state of Wyoming, type in XYZ LLC. What populates the information that populates from the secretary of state does not even contain my name. So that individual who's trying to figure out who owns that LLC would not be able to tie two and two together. All right, nobody would be able to know that I otherwise own that LLC that otherwise holds my very valuable trading account. And so for a lot of you investors, uh, if possible, we want to instill some anonymity wherever we can. There's nothing wrong with having some anonymity in your holdings, okay? You're not required to have your name plastered all over the internet uh, in connection with holding some, in some instances, very valuable uh, brokerage accounts or business entities that hold those valuable brokerage accounts, okay? There's not a requirement. So that's why jurisdiction shopping is very important for my trader clients, all right? And so the top three states for asset protection, for anonymity, and for taxes uh, for that matter as well, uh, Wyoming, Nevada, and Delaware, all right? Now, Delaware, we typically go to Delaware when we're going to be taking a company public. All right. They have very good shareholder protections. They have a court of chancery. Uh, Delaware law is just widely accepted um, for publicly traded companies. OK, but as small businesses, we're going to gear more towards Wyoming and Nevada. Now, the laws pertaining to Wyoming and Nevada, very similar to one another. OK, really, the only difference is Nevada is about three or four times more expensive to maintain a business entity in Nevada than it is in Wyoming, all right? Uh, Nevada, for a while, Nevada was the only state that had uh, business courts, dedicated business courts to hear business disputes. But as of the last legislative session, uh, Wyoming legislators implemented similar mechanisms in the court and the judicial system in Wyoming. So now Wyoming also has business courts. And it's really, a, a it's always just a continual race between Wyoming and Nevada as to which state is going to be uh, ranked number one for asset protection uh, for small businesses on an annual basis. They're continually in a race with one another. And it really benefits us as investors because these states, while many other states are continually weakening their asset protection for business entities, for small business owners, you have states like Wyoming and Nevada that are doing the exact opposite. They have a vested interest in continually strengthening their laws. I mean, they make a lot of money based on individuals coming to those states and setting up business entities in those states. And so again, they have a very vested interest in maintaining that, okay? And so now when we are uh, going to implement a plan of our own, again, here's a little plan of action that you can each uh, keep in mind right, in order to achieve or avail ourselves to those very beneficial tax mitigation principles and asset protection principles, we need to start putting that plan in motion, right? Uh, once you need this, it, it, let's say you're getting sued right now in your individual capacity, it's already too late to implement this. Once a lawsuit has been filed, or once you even have constructive knowledge that a lawsuit may be filed, and then you rush to try and get one of these structures in place to protect your assets from the potential claims of that plaintiff, it is already too late. A judge reserves the right to reverse any such transactions that were done to, uh, how they phrase it under the law is defraud a creditor or put your assets out of reach of a creditor. All right, so once you have knowledge that a creditor is coming after you or may come after you, then it is too late to have these structures then put in place and expect to be protected by them. So the optimal time to get these plans in place is while there is a lull, while you are not facing any litigation, maybe while you're sitting up quarantined in your home office, right? That's the perfect time to get these plans in place. 
So I've talked a, a little bit about trading out of uh, business entities for asset protection. Okay, for those of you that were trading out of your own name, you should certainly not be doing so uh, for those very principles. Okay, asset protection, tax mitigation. You just don't get the same benefit as you do when you do those same activities through a business entity. And then the next piece I want to talk about is a uh, living trust, okay? So the living trust, that's your estate plan. That is the linchpin that's gonna hold everything together. Uh, and so the living trust, that is, you can think of it as a, a suitcase and whatever you put in that suitcase, you're gonna be able to hand off to the next person, to the designated person after you pass away. And that designated person will then be empowered and able to carry out your wishes as you've set forth in writing during your lifetime. Right? That's effectively what a living trust is. Uh, and I mean, obviously that's boiled down quite simply and we're gonna delve a little bit deeper into what exactly goes into making the living trust and, and why it's such a valuable part of your overall asset protection structure. Right? As I mentioned, it's that, you see it down at the bottom of the screen, it's that linchpin that holds everything together. Jason, portfolio builders, they're teaching you how to grow your net worth, how to grow your asset value uh, hopefully to just exponential proportions, all right? So now that is all occurring while you're alive, but it's equally as important to have a plan in place so that when you do pass away, again, not if, but when you do pass away, so that all the hard work that you put into growing that asset base, it doesn't just dissipate overnight, okay? You can, by way of a living trust, you can put in a plan that lasts for one, two, 300 years down the road. And, you know, a lot of you may be thinking, well, you know, I simply don't have the assets right now. I'm maybe only worth, you know, $500,000, a million, two million. Well, there's no way I could put a plan in place that lasts for hundreds of years. That's actually not true at all. When you pass away, there's a surefire way that you can, uh, a surefire mechanism that you can put in place to fund your estate plan uh, to be able to carry on your wishes for hundreds of years and essentially create a dynasty, and that is insurance, okay? Uh, but that's, again, a topic for another day. Uh, insurance is a, is a little bit of a, a different animal and outside the scope of what I want to talk about uh, here with you guys today. So uh, just real quick before we get into the living trust, I do want to talk uh, just quickly about investing with your retirement plan. So I know for those of you that aren't trading out of your own name, some of you may be trading out of 401ks or IRAs. Um, those are tax deferred accounts, uh, save for a Roth. Some of you may be trading out of a Roth account. Uh, I get the question a lot as to what's better, a Roth or a traditional account. Um, it, it really, if you run the numbers, it, it almost equates to the same, assuming that the tax rates stay the same or similar. Now, if we're anticipating tax rates, and I'm talking about individual tax rates, we're anticipating those tax rates to raise or rise in the future, then you'd be better off in a Roth account. Uh, but if tax rates are gonna stay marginally the same, roughly it's going to equate to a, a very similar um, benefits as to whether or not you're investing through a Roth or a traditional account, okay? And for those of you that aren't aware, a Roth account is simply, you're making after-tax deductions. Uh, so you're paying tax today, and then you're never paying tax on the gains in that Roth account ever again, all right? As opposed to a traditional 401k or traditional IRA, that is a tax deferred account. You're getting a current income tax deduction on your taxes in the current year in which you make the contribution. But the trade-off is the IRS is gonna require you to take distributions uh, no later than age 72. You're, you're able to take distributions from those accounts as early as 59, but you must start taking distributions by age 72. Uh, those uh, laws were actually just changed very recently back in December. Uh, they set up, uh, Congress passed the SECURE Act. They always come up with these interesting uh, uh, monikers. It was setting every community up for retirement act. Uh, but I mean, really, that's just uh, putting some lipstick on a pig. Uh, the, the actual laws that were implemented under that act uh, weren't so beneficial to the taxpayer. Uh, you used to be able to inherit an IRA or a 401k and be able to stretch that inherited IRA or 401k over your remaining lifetime. Now they actually reduce that. Uh, no longer are you able to stretch 
those IRAs or 401ks, those inherited accounts. Uh, you're not able to stretch. Instead, the IRS is going to make you draw down those accounts uh, within 10 years, meaning that the IRS, again, but at the end of the day, it's just increasing the tax receipts to the IRS. Uh, because again, instead of stretching that inherited account over potentially 20, 30, 40 years, uh, they're requiring you to draw it down over 10 years, increasing the time within which they'll uh, recover their tax revenue. Okay. Uh, so again, trading out of a tax uh, deferred or uh, tax free account, such as a Roth, um, you, you are able to do all the same things, uh, seeing it, so long as it's a, a self directed account. Okay. So I know for some of you that have a 401k through a current employer, you may be saying, no, they don't let me invest in anything other than a few ETFs and mutual funds. Yeah, unfortunately that is the case. That's not because that's what the law requires, uh, but that's just the deal that your employer has struck with the custodian. Essentially those custodians, they make money by restricting your access to your own money. And so uh, what we can do actually is let's go back to this slide over here. Uh, for those of you that do want to or are interested in setting up a tax deferred or tax free account uh, to invest in these very uh, portfolio builder strategies using, uh, we can set up a 401k that's sponsored by your own corporation. So uh, a 401k is a type of qualified retirement plan. So I'm just going to put QRP right here but you can set up your own 401k that you are the trustee of. Uh, again, a, a 401k is nothing more than a trust. It's a trust account. So we can set up a, a, your own qualified retirement plan, your own 401k that your own corporation sponsors that you are in charge of, that you are in control of. So you get to determine what you're going to invest in. You can invest in securities, bonds, uh, real estate, whatever you so choose. Uh, and again, that's because that's what federal law allows. Um, but I know some of you may be severely restricted in your investment selections as it stands today due to the fact that your employer has otherwise negotiated those terms, uh, obviously not with any input from its employees. Uh, now, so, Aaron, no. uh, on that, what about an existing account? Could you transfer it into that type of structure? Can you can you merge it underneath that, that type of structure? How, how would that work? Yeah, great question. So if you do have an existing IRA, you could certainly roll that over into your own qualified retirement plan, into your own 401k. And the benefits to doing so are that when you're operating under a 401k, that is a qualified retirement plan. That is an ERISA qualified plan under federal law. Uh, so with the QRPs, the Qualified Retirement Plans, they have higher protections under the law because they have federal statutory protections as opposed to IRAs. IRAs, they, the protections that are afforded to IRAs are derived from state law. And again, as we've already discussed, state law varies widely from state to state. So some states don't even protect your IRAs in the event that you get sued. So there's definitely uh, multiple reasons to consider rolling over any IRAs into a 401k. Um, again, in addition to those creditor protections, you also have bankruptcy protection too. Uh, but yes, it is possible to roll over IRAs or 401ks from a prior employer, assuming that your current employer doesn't allow in-service rollovers. Um, and you can roll over those 401ks from prior employers into this newly formed 401k. All right. oh, so there's a it. lot of uh, possibilities and flexibility <laughs> that you can instill in your overall asset protection structure by tacking on that additional piece, that qualified retirement plan. Okay, cool. So yeah. there you go, guys. Everyone that's had problems with that limitation, you now have a solution at the end. Yep, exactly. And so uh, in, a, in addition to everything that we talked about, again, talking about how to protect the assets that you're generating, uh, the increase in net worth that you're generating during your lifetime, in my opinion, equally as important as having a succinct plan in place for when you pass away. All right? And I know for a lot of people, this could be a taboo subject, uncomfortable, uh, but especially in light of kind of the just general social environment that we're living in right now, living in, in the midst of this pandemic. This has put front and center estate planning and uh, just underscoring the importance of having a plan because you simply don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. That, that's the bottom line is we don't. And so now AARP, they did uh, a poll and this is 
a few years ago, I think it was back in like 2012, but only 23% of American adults over 50 have a trust. That wow. number is appalling. Now, I understand in part why that number is so low is because there is a vested interest in probate attorneys in encouraging their clients to not have a living trust because there is a big money making uh, aspect of our judicial system that is the probate court, the whole probate system. Now, I'm sure some of you have been through a probate before. It is not a fun process. But all a probate is, it's a legal proceeding by which to get assets transferred out of the name of somebody who passed away, of a decedent, right? So if you pass away owning assets in your personal name, you, your loved ones have got to then go hire an attorney and then open up a probate case in order to get those assets transferred over to whomever they're intended to go to, all right? That can be very expensive and time consuming, all right? The average length of a probate is about 18 months. And as we know, our court system is not getting any less congested, all right? I mean, hey, we look at our court system right now. They are closed. They are outright closed right now, meaning that when we come back from this uh, lull, whatever you want to call it, once the courts are open back up, there is going to be such a logjam, both in probate, civil court, criminal court. It is going to be a mess uh, when we come back, once the courts are opened up. And so, I mean, to that effect, you know, with the state plan, you can allow your loved ones to bypass the probate process altogether by simply doing some planning while you're still alive. All right, it's not that hard of a process, uh, albeit those probate attorneys would make you think otherwise. Because again, those probate attorneys, they don't make money off of you if they don't probate your estate, all right? And so you're guaranteeing probate uh, or your family members having to go through probate if you only have a will or if you have no estate planning documents whatsoever. So again, a will guarantees probate. You must probate a will. And uh, again, probate attorneys, they won't really encourage you to go get a living trust because then they don't get to earn those statutorily assessed probate fees, probate attorney fees on the back end, right? I'm sure some of you have seen uh, $99 will advertisements, whether on TV, on billboards, on the radio, those attorneys aren't doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. No, they're doing it because, okay, yeah, they, they're they certainly going to eat some cost on the front end, right? If you think about it, it's going to take them at least two hours of attorney time billed on average, let's say $350 an hour. So that's $700 uh, in re lost revenue. Well, they're charging 100 So that's $600 of lost revenue that they're eating on the front end. But the trade-off is when they're drafting that will, they're putting their firm's information in the margins of that will. So that way, when mom or dad passes away and the kids go open up the file cabinet to look for mom or dad's will, oh, well, what do you know? There's an attorney, there's a law firm information printed right on the will. Let's go to this attorney. I'm sure they dealt with mom or dad. They know uh, their assets. And so let's just you know take the, the question out of it and go have them deal with it. And then they get statutorily awarded probate fees as a percentage of the overall estate. So again, in summary, there's a vested interest for the misinformation, okay? Uh, having in place or putting in place a living trust that will allow you to take control of your own estate. It'll keep it out of the court system. So a probate, uh, a probate case, it becomes, just like with any other court case, it's public information. Anybody can simply go look up type in your name and see what your estate consisted of because again after you pass away in a probate uh in a probate proceeding the first thing that the personal representative of the estate does is take an inventory of the estate and guess what that inventory gets published and so again it's just a privacy thing if you've taken some steps to you know instill some privacy while you're alive why would you want all of a sudden when you pass away to for all your assets all your affairs to become public and so the easiest way to keep that from happening is by instilling or drafting a living trust, okay? A living trust, it allows for your loved ones to avoid probate, right? And you know what, <laughs> some clients, unfortunately, they simply say, eh, you know what, I'll be dead. They can deal with it, right? Now, <laughs> look, that, that's a very short-sighted in my opinion. I don't know why you would want to throw just a, a bag of problems on your loved ones upon your passing. When your loved ones, they should be remembering you, grieving, 
uh, and not having to worry about court proceedings, paying attorney's fees, and whether or not they're going to get the assets that are in the estate sooner than a year and a half after passing. So again, with a living trust, you can avoid all that. And it doesn't require an attorney other than to draft the living trust. You want to make sure that the trust is drafted appropriately. And then that next bullet point right there, keep family relationships intact. The most contentious settlement conference I was ever a part of uh, was in a probate proceeding and brother and sister were literally suing one another in this probate matter over a little trinket that wasn't worth more than $20, but obviously it had some sentimental value uh, to each one of them. But mom, the, the mother had passed away with no direction, no will, uh, and brother and sister then hired an attorney. Each one hired an attorney, paid them $350 an hour. I know, because I was one of those attorneys. Paid them $350 an hour to argue over who should get the little trinket that wasn't even worth $20. Okay, so again, even having in, in that case, the mother would have benefited even from having a will. All right. Uh, but again, the will still has to go through probate. So the best uh, uh, mitigation, the best tool that you can put in place to allow your family to simply focus on grieving is this living trust because it keeps you out of court. And it is a written plan from A to Z as to how you want your assets to be distributed. All right, and since it doesn't involve the courts, it expedites estate distribution. And should you so choose, as I mentioned, you can put in a plan to create a dynasty. Okay, you can, there are, and once again, referring back to the difference between state laws, states like Nevada, you can create a trust that lasts for 365 years. All right. And so if you create, and a, a trust is nothing more than a contract. And as with any contract, you can choose which state's laws are going to apply to the contract. And so you don't have to live in Nevada to otherwise have a trust that is domiciled and interpreted according to Nevada law. And so utilizing those principles, uh, we draft all our trusts in accordance with Nevada law because they have such good protections for beneficiaries, for trustees of trust, and then also the trust administration principles. They're very favorable to uh, trustors, to grantors, people who create the trust to begin with. And so uh, in putting together that living trust, as I mentioned, you can, it's a very flexible and customizable document. Now I have a lot of clients that just wanna do die and distribute. That's fine, right? Uh, when you pass away, when Joe passes away, he just wants his entire estate to be uh, inventoried and then liquidated and then all the proceeds split between his children. You can most certainly do that. But as you see right up there, you got to be careful of converting it to marital property. So, for example, if Joe passes away, has his $1 million estate liquidated and split between his four kids, each one getting an equal 25 percent. Well, if, uh, child number one is, in fact, married uh, at the time when he receives that $250,000 distribution. And then uh, child number one commingles those funds with that joint bank account with uh, his wife. And then they subsequently get divorced. Well, that $250,000 inheritance is now going to be subject to the claims of that future ex-spouse. So that's what, for one reason, that's why I'm not a huge fan of dying distribute. Uh, and what I prefer is a trust paying for needs and distributing at ages. So same example, uh, you've got the decedent person who passes away, million dollar estate, four children. He can put in his living trust that I want, you know, upon my passing, each child gets a $20,000 distribution that they could do whatever they want with. And then at, as soon as each one of my children attains the age of 25, they're going to be entitled to uh, another $50,000 distribution. Then at age 30, they're going to be entitled to a $100,000 distribution. And then at age 35, uh, whatever is the remaining at that point in time is going to be divided up into uh, four equal shares and then distributed accordingly. Okay. That, again, that's just one example of literally an unlimited number of ways that you can distribute your estate after passing. Uh, again, it's a highly customizable document. Uh, so you could even keep into account and have uh, your trustee uh, be able to make distributions, uh, discretionary distributions for maybe a child or a beneficiary that isn't good with money. Or maybe you have a child or another beneficiary uh, that has had drug problems in the past. And so you can require that beneficiary to take a drug test 
prior to being eligible for a distribution from the trust. Okay, and it's not meant to be punitive either. If that child then, or if that beneficiary then fails that drug test, the trust can then be authorized to pay for rehab on behalf of that beneficiary. Again, you can get as customizable as you want here. And then uh, one other permissible way that uh, you can, if there is a special needs beneficiary and that beneficiary is receiving state or federal aid, you don't want to inadvertently disqualify that special needs child from uh, receiving that state or federal aid. So you can allow your successor trustee, the person who you've empowered to carry out the terms of your trust after you've passed away, you can empower that successor trustee to make those distributions in accordance with those principles, to never make a distribution that would otherwise disqualify that beneficiary from receiving that state or federal aid. Again, in summary, these are very flexible and customizable documents. All right, uh, but the living trust, that's not the only part of the overall estate plan. Uh, there's supporting documents that comprise the overall estate plan, albeit the living trust is the main document, but then there's also the schedule of gifts. So if you have jewelry, artwork, uh, antiques, anything that doesn't have a title, uh, then you would uh, account for that in the schedule of gifts, which you can handwrite. So that way you don't need to amend the trust every time that you want to change a permissible beneficiary that would receive that asset. Uh, a very important document for those of you with minor children, your guardianship documents having a written plan in place. So that way, again, it doesn't result in infighting as to who is going to receive a guardianship over the minor children upon your premature passing. Uh, then your powers of attorney. This is a big one, guys. Uh, if you are incapacitated, uh, right, you haven't passed away, but you've become incapacitated for whatever reason. You need somebody who you've authorized to carry out your affairs while you're not able to, you're on your own accord. So that's both for financial and medical uh, purposes. You want to make sure that these documents are in place. Again, once they are needed and you don't have them in place, it's too late, right? If you're incapacitated and you don't have the powers of attorney already executed, well, obviously you can't do so when you're incapacitated. So then it's just going to be by operation of law as to whom is going to be the authorized person to be able to carry out those, um, those uh, responsibilities on your behalf. All right. So again, living trust, that is the linchpin that holds everything together at the end of the day, right? We're going to instill these asset protection and tax mitigation principles to allow our net worth to flourish while we're alive. And then that living trust holds everything together at the end of the day and allows us to distribute those assets that we've worked very hard to acquire and maintain uh, without giving away to creditors, without giving it away to the IRS, and then being able to distribute and pass on those assets to our loved ones after our passing. Okay, so that does conclude my presentation, I have some time to take some questions right now, should there be any. And as I mentioned, I, I had to keep it general during this presentation. All right, but we do have that link posted uh, that you can click on and utilize to uh, then schedule a one on one consultation with our advisors. Okay, so hey, I have a quick question if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Um, back on the slide where you show the uh, Six thousand dollars to the corporation and eighty-five hundred dollars worth of expenses. What happens to the extra twenty-five hundred dollars? Um, what are you able to do with that? Okay, so negative yeah, income. Event, so we had just to recap. So us as individuals, we incurred an eighty-five hundred dollar expense on behalf of our corporation. We incurred that expense prior to our corporation having any income, so it couldn't pay for it on its own. Uh, and then once our corporation then generated that first six thousand dollars of income it's then able to reimburse us for uh, in that amount. It, if it had made $10,000 of income, it would have been able to reimburse us the full 8,500, okay? But since it only made 6,000, it reimburses us as much as it's able to. And then it just continues to carry that $2,500 additional expense on its books until it has the requisite income and is able to then reimburse us uh, and make us whole. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you just carry it forward to the next year and keep writing it off and exactly income exceeds expenses. Okay. Yep. Aaron. All right. Let's see. 
Uh, let me look through this chat here, see if there's any questions. Uh, Okay, so I'm not seeing any in the chat. Anybody else uh, want to turn on your mic, to, uh, ask a question verbally? Aaron, yes, can you hear me? Aaron, can uh, you hear me? Yeah, Don Weir, you go, go ahead, okay. buddy. Aaron, Aaron, I've got a, just a, a, a general question. So if sure. I'm understanding this right, what you're saying is that we should first have a C corporation and then a limited partnership or a LLC, and then a living trust. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Is that in general? Yes, yeah, that is correct, Donald. Uh, yeah, those are the essential components that you're going to need uh, in one form or another to, the, and those will comprise your asset protection structure. Okay, okay. Next, next question, now, do they all like the, corporation and the LLC, do they need to be uh, domiciled in the same state or can they be, for instance, I, I, I have a corporation. I do not have an LLC. Do they have to come from the same state or does it make any difference? At all? Uh, so your state of residency is going to have some implications there. So where do you reside, Donald? I, I reside in Arkansas. In Arkansas. So yeah, we would typically set up your corporation in your home state, okay? And then we would set up uh, the trading entity, whether it's a limited partnership or an LLC, you'd set it up in either Nevada or Wyoming. And then, um, yeah, you would go about the structure in that capacity. Uh, but again, that's, it's not, it, I, I make it sound really simple, uh, but that's, there's a lot of different factors to consider. So that's why, again, we want you to sit down one-on-one -on -one with uh, one of our advisors. So that way they can go through the whole host of considerations that we need to take into effect. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. So if uh, we are interested with, uh, uh, with setting up that way, um, who, who do we have to talk to? Who do you have to talk to? Uh, there's a link that's posted in the chat. Um, it looks like, uh, yeah, it was posted again at 1150. You could click on that link. That'll take you to a page where you can then get scheduled with one of our strategists to go over your unique individual circumstances. Okay. Uh, where's the link? Uh, it's in the chat box, Jack, and then I'm going to message it to you uh, right now too. Okay. Okay. Message me. Thank you so much. Of yep. course. My pleasure. My pleasure, Jack. Okay, cool. And uh, you have it in your in your personal chat box too. And then, um, so let's see here, guys. Um, and then, if you guys want to, uh, just uh, just email me, Dean at portfoliobuilder.io. Uh, if for some reason you know you, you're on phone, you don't have the chat box or something, uh, I'll, I'll send it out directly to you guys. But just just shoot me an email so I, I know. But uh, but yeah, I'll post the link one more time in the chat box here. And uh, all you have to do. Uh, to get your meetup is click on that link, okay? Fill out your your the, your information, come to bottom, and then um, one of either or his, you know one of his teammates uh, will reach out to you and schedule your call. Yes, sir. Okay, cool. um, how much is the total? Yeah, Hello, can you can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, how much is the total uh, setup fee, the whole thing estimated? Uh, so that's going to be something that is going to be best left to the advisor, uh, because again, each one of you is in a different circumstance. For example, some of you may come in with your own business entities and whatnot. So uh, again, by clicking on that link and getting scheduled with one of our advisors, with one of our strategists, they'll be able to go over all that information uh, with you from A to Z, including cost and, and maintenance and everything that comes along with. Okay. So I, uh, I did uh, put my name there and I put my phone number. So somebody is going to give me a call. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. just make sure to click on that link that was also sent to, to your individual chat. Box. Yeah, yeah. I, I click the link and then I um, uh, put my name there. Yep. And I submit it. That's it. Already. Yeah. And we'll have one of our advisors reach out to you. All right. Sounds good. Hey, guys, I have to go. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah. Hey, my pleasure, Jack. Awesome. Bye-bye. Okay, cool. 
All right, and Donald, did you have another question there, bud? I saw your uh, your microphone was unmuted uh, before Jack jumped in. D did you have another question, bud? No, I'm fine, Dean. Thank you so much. Okay, my pleasure, guys. All right, well, Aaron, uh, thank you so much, bud, uh, once again for all the information. I can tell you, we uh, Jason and I were sitting there salivating <laughs> uh, <laughs> yesterday and again today. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get a lot of stuff uh, set up with you guys and yeah. a lot of a lot of structures put in place with our business certainly. And so the, hey, the more you know, the the more tools you realize there are at your disposal. So yep, that's what we're here for. Help all yeah. you guys help. Okay, yeah, awesome, man. Yeah, I you know. I, and I, I saw, you know, I, I read how all of these billionaires get away with paying less than 10% tax. Yep. And then after going through your presentation yesterday, I was going, oh, what, you know, this is, uh, this is exactly how we do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Yep. The top 1%, they employ these same exact strategies. It's, it's just uh, access to information. So. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Well, Aaron, um, once again, wonderful information. Oh, Jack, do you have one more question, bud? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, no, guys. No. Awesome. Well, thank you all for your team. And uh, make sure to um, click on that link into your information. And one of the Anderson uh, lawyers will, will be in contact with you. And guys, I, I really think the biggest part, what you know, from what I've learned, and I'm just one person, but uh, I, I really think the biggest differentiation from what Aaron and his team can offer you is that literally you have lawyers and CPAs combined. Okay. Because I've talked to multiple CPAs about similar setups and they don't know the legal parameters of it. Mm. Knowing the legal parameters is more important in my opinion than knowing how to do the math on it. <laughs> right. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's the reason that uh, Jason and I set up this partnership and uh, definitely uh, look forward to, uh, structuring a couple of things personally, a couple of things within our business, um, and uh, definitely just having um, you know a, a better knowledge base uh, to move forward uh, as I continue to create wealth and and uh, you know really eliminate risk in the process too. So uh, exactly, and, multi pronged thank, approach. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Awesome, Aaron. Well, hey, bud, thank you so much for your time once again. And I think with that, guys, um, Ryan, if you're still on, if you can close this out, I think we're all set.